Welcome to Orlando for the 31st edition of the Florida Classic, where Bethune-Cookman sits unbeaten atop the MEAC Conference. Today, they face in-state rival Florida A&M, who's lurking one game behind. It's a contest that means more than the top spot in the standings. It's a rivalry that also highlights the famous Battle of the Bands. MEAC football is next. We're at the Citrus Bowl in Orlando, Florida for the 31st edition of the Florida Classic presented by McDonald's. It's the Wildcats of Bethune-Cookman trying to keep its unbeaten record intact as they take on the Rattlers of Florida A&M. How big is this game? Well, let's check out the latest MEAC standings. Bethune leads the conference with a perfect 10-0 record. Florida A&M has only one loss in the conference and a win by the Rattlers and a loss by South Carolina State would put FAMU in the FCS playoffs. Hello, everyone. I'm Charlie Neal, and throughout the game, I'll be bringing you updates on what's happening in black college football. As for this particular game, well, in the past, the records between these two teams really didn't mean a whole lot. It was for bragging rights, but this year, it's a different story because Bethune-Cookman comes in unbeaten, trying to keep that unbeaten record intact and looking to get to the FCS playoffs for the first time since 2002. Florida A&M, on the other hand, is going to try to snap that unbeaten streak, and they're hoping for a win by North Carolina a and today over South Carolina State. And for more on today's action, let's throw it upstairs to the guys who are going to be calling the game, Dave Lamont and J.C. Pearson. Gentlemen. All right, Charlie, thank you very much. Looking forward to hearing from you throughout the game, particularly when you're monitoring the amazing battle of the bands coming up at halftime. Now, in the past, J.C., sometimes that was the best part of the game. But as Charlie mentioned, there's great significance here for both schools. And for Bethune this year, the key has certainly been their great quarterback play from Matt Johnson. Well, Matt Johnson is not very big, Dave, at 5'10", 175, but he plays very big was just named the MEAC offensive player of the year he leads his team in rushing 675 yards and very accurate as a passer 65 percent completion ratio this guy is a true dual threat that's going to be tough for FAMU to stop today now he is a one-man balanced attack but for FAMU to crack one of the toughest teams in FCS defensively they need a balanced attack they need a great game out of a guy banged up earlier in the year but he's healthy now in Philip Sylvester well there's no question that Sylvester is the catalyst for this FAMU offense and I don't think it's a coincidence that they're on a five-game winning streak right now and he has five straight 100 yard rushing games plays with a lot of speed and a lot of quickness he's a big play guy that's capable of scoring from anywhere on the football field these schools only about 250 miles apart this rivalry builds up every year and will culminate what we expect to be an explosive football game and a remarkable halftime show it's a full day's entertainment coming at you kickoff right around the corner When you join together talented student athletes with great. We're at the Citrus Bowl in Orlando, Florida, 31st edition of the Florida Classic. Bethune Cookman getting ready to do battle against the Rattlers of Florida AM. When you talk about the Florida Classic, it is celebrating its 31st year. In fact, the first Florida Classic was played back in 1978. In fact, the first 17 Florida Classics was played in Tampa, Florida. But then it eventually moved here to Orlando, Florida. And since it's moved here, the attendance before it moved here was just averaging about over 40,000 fans. But since it's moved here to Orlando, Florida, the fan attendance has averaged over 60,000 folks in attendance. In fact, it's jumped to over 67,000. The largest crowd to witness the annual matchup came back in 2003 with uh, 73,000 that came in to see Bethune, Cookman Edge, Florida a m 39-35. And Florida a m has a distinct edge in this series, leading the Florida Classic 20-10, to including wins the last two years. So we'll see if Joe Taylor can make it three in a row, Dave. All right, Charlie, and one of the things with Boone Cookman is they take the field. Coming in here 10 and 0 in the first year for Brian Jenkins. After taking over from Alvin Wyatt, who has established quite a tradition and quite a name for himself at Bethune-Cookman University, but this is Brian Jenkins' team now, and he was just named yesterday the MEAC Coach of the Year. Pretty unusual to walk onto a campus first year and not lose a game yet. Yeah, he's really changed the entire culture, the attitude of the team, and instilled a lot of discipline, and obviously all the kids have bought into what he was trying to preach to them. And here come the Rattlers from Tallahassee. <laughs> Oh! 
coached by Joe Taylor, who's in his third year, 23 and 9 with the Rattlers, but he's one of the great coaches in FCS history. With 221 victories, number 10 all time in football championship series wins. A great crowd. They were telling us yesterday that ticket sales were very brisk on Friday for this game. And again, it's not a great long drive at all for the Bethune folks. They come from Daytona, about an hour south of Orlando. Tallahassee takes a little bit more of a trip, but not too bad. About three and a half, four hours, depending on how aggressive you are on the roads. <laughs> <laughs> Bethune won the toss, by the way. They have elected to receive, so we're going to get a chance to see Matt Johnson's offense right away. But, J.C., let's get some keys to the game in here. First off, for Bethune. Well, when you look at Bethune-Cookman, keys to the game for them offensively is they've got to continue to, to run the ball. They come in averaging 236 yards a game rushing. They've got to continue to do that. And then defensively, their main focus is stopping Philip Sylvester from running the football today. They've got to get a lot of hats on him and game tackling. And then now we take a good look at Joe Taylor. What's got to happen for FAMU to get out of here with a victory? Well, for FAMU today, obviously, they've got to come in. They've got to match the intensity. But the big keys for them offensively, offensively is they want to be more balanced offensively. They've got to get their young quarterback trainer really comfortable early, give them some early throws, get them in a flow earlier. And then defensively, they've got to let Matt, make Matt Johnson one-dimensional. They can't let him run and throw. They've got to take something away from him. They're going to try to make him just a pure passer today in order to be successful. Well, Matt Johnson on the year, 65% passer. He just mentioned the MEAC Offensive Player of the Year. He leads the MEAC in pass efficiency. In the meantime, Bethune is a threat with Preston Cleckley and Courtney Keith running back to kicks. And Keith, number one, has housed one already this year. That's what's at stake for the Wildcats. They win it, and there's no argument about who the MEAC champion is. If Fan Yu comes up with a win, it can get interesting, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. The Florida Classic is underway. And this is Cleckley at around the one. And he barely gets 10 yards. They're going to give him to the 13 for a 12-yard return. So poor field position for the Wildcats. And their senior quarterback out of Fort Lauderdale, Matt Johnson. Thrown for nearly 2,000 yards on the year, 13 touchdowns and only five intercepts. He also has seven rushing touchdowns, J.C., and averages about five yards a carry. Yeah, and they're going to come out, and they run a no-huddle offense, and tempo is the key for them. They can either speed it up to stop FAMU from defensive substitutions, or they can slow it down and get the call in from the side, but they're a no-huddle type of offense. They'll go right away on the ground and get it out to the 19-yard line. So a solid gain of six that time for Bethune. Ambrose Bell, outstanding running back, averages almost seven yards a pop. Keep an eye on that receiving board. They spread the ball around on this attack. And Teal Curry, by the way, the center, made the first team all MEAC team that was announced, along, of course, with his quarterback, Matt Johnson. There's a fumble on the snap by Johnson. A little careless on the handle. And it's going to be a loss back of the six yards they gained on the previous play. And yeah, you just talked about both of those guys, a first-team all MEAC selections. Curry, the center, snaps the ball. And I'm not sure if Johnson was actually ready. He had his eyes looking at the defense down the field. And I think the snap surprised him a little bit. So third down, they're going to call it nine. Johnson trying to throw for the first time, but you see his ability to get away, but he will not get to the first down marker. He was shoved out of bounds by Marvin Ross. So Johnson a little bit shy in Bethune, and of course that one near turnover, and ironically, they're so good at causing turnovers, they almost messed themselves up, so they're going to wind up bringing in the punter, Corey Kowalski. And 
Antonio Lawrence is in single safety at around the 40 yard line. Kowalski has struggled occasionally, averages 35 yards a punt. This one's not bad. And that's a muff, and looks like it made it out of bounds before it was completely recovered. We'll wait and get the official word from the field, but it does look like the ball will belong to the Rattlers. So we've seen perhaps some nerves in this game, JC. This is a, just a simple drop. Yeah, you, a little nerves, a little intensity right here. and just takes his eyes off the ball. See him looking down at the coverage, but the first thing you got to do as a return guy is make sure you catch the ball before you start to run. Obviously, you talked about how big of a game this is. Everybody wants to make a big play, but you got to really settle down and not try to do too much. Chris Perry was the Bethune player in pursuit for Brian Jenkins, who's pleading his case and is not going to get anywhere with the official. So there you take an Austin trainer making just his third start. An interesting story of how he emerged as the quarterback for the Rattlers. And they're going to come out with a flea flicker right away, trying to go down to the sideline, trying to find Kevin Elliott, and he makes the catch as he inbounds. The field judge gives him the ball at the nine. The issue becomes, did he ever step out of bounds in the first place? Just a little throwback to start the game, a little gadget play. And now trainer just throws it up for grabs right here. You can see he's out of bounds already. Comes back in and then never actually controls the ball and possesses it. You have to possess that ball all the way. You can see he's out of bounds, comes back in, but right there is still juggling the football. Ozzie Slater in coverage and the official apparently not noticing that he was out of bounds and right away, FAMU's in the end zone. That's Philip Sylvester. So a 57-yard drive and a couple of plays. One a spectacular catch and throw off the flea flicker, and then you saw... Sylvester and why some of the coaches around the MEAC think he's got a chance to play at the next level. Yeah, very good running back, very strong, fast, but they use the pass, the first play out, to kind of loosen up that Bethune-Cookman defense, then they come back with the run. So Philip Sylvester's eighth rushing touchdown of the season, and Bethune has rarely trailed. In fact, only one other game this season have the Wildcats fallen behind. That was to Hampton. They're trailing in Orlando right now. My computer runs twice as fast. The computer has run. This is a rare position for Bethune to be in this season. This is the fastest any team has scored against them this year. And Bethune has only surrendered 16 first quarter points this season. But... It only took two plays yeah. for the Rattlers to get on the board. And only 16 touchdowns all year long as well. But you, know, you got to give FAMU a lot of credit. Come out, be very aggressive on the first play. Give Bethune-Cookman something to think about. Loosen them up, and now you come back and hit them with the run for a touchdown by Sylvester. So it seemed like just a couple of minutes ago that Preston Cleckley and Courtney Keith were back deep for the Wildcats. They are in the black uniforms of the maroon and gold trim. And this will be Keith stepping in front. And great coverage. That's two kicks now. The Rattler special teams has barely given up a 10-yard return. JC, let's go back to that quick touchdown drive. Well, just, they just open up with just a, a fake run, the pitch back, and then Trainer just throws it down the field, up for grabs. And then watch at the end right here. Great job by Kevin Elliott fighting for the ball. And now the next play, Philip Sylvester does what he does best. And that's to run the ball into the end zone. Great start to the game for FAMU. That's all it took, 56 yards officially in under 50 seconds. Isidore Jackson, now the fullback position, and Johnson instead will keep it. And he's got some running room for the first down and plenty more for Johnson. No one even got a finger on him until he got to the 40-yard line, and he is brought down at the 44-yard line by Elvis Graham. 
And there's what Johnson does so well, and I guess he's got the freedom to do whichever. Now, he leaves the field here, J.C. Yeah. And they bring in Jackie Wilson, the second-string quarterback. We were told there might be a package of plays for him. Yeah, and Jackie's got six rushing touchdowns on the year, so they want to get him involved because they like the way he runs the ball. And no mistaking what their intentions were with Jackie Wilson as he gets it out to the 48. For four, here is the FAMU defense for coordinators Tim Edwards and Earl Holmes. Ramos, three sacks on the year. Hollinghead, two and a half sacks. We've already seen Alvis Graham make a play. And in the secondary, Hall is a first team all MEAC performer. Holcomb, a second team all MEAC player. Johnson back in at quarterback. He'll hand off and for the first time. Bethune with Jackson running the ball is into FAMU territory. This is just a second drive, a gain of four there to the Rattlers 48-yard line. And FAMU defensively, they're a base 3-4 defense, so they have three down linemen, four linebackers, but they'll jump into a four down lineman package. They like to bring a lot of five-man front, so a lot of times those outside linebackers play closer to the line of scrimmage. They, they like to bring a lot of pressure, 70% blitz team. And Johnson's got a man open at the 25-yard line, and he overthrew his target. Incomplete. Trying to get it to Randy James, a sophomore out of Miami. And looked like the receiver was tackled, J.C., but I'm wondering if the official just thought the ball was too far to Well, run. you see the end of the play right here. Ojo, number 25, is beat. It looks like he's there just a little bit early, but like you said, the, ref the officials may have thought that this ball was not a catchable ball, but he's definitely there early. So for the second time today, Corey Kowalski, now this is a Bethune team that came in here averaging 41 points a game and 441 total yards a game. Number six in FCS football, number two in FCS football in scoring, but they are 0 for 2 so far. Kowalski just hits a little line drive. This is Lawrence, and Lawrence still working and got it out to the 21-yard line, a 39-yard punt and about a 13-yard return, but there is a flag down on the play at the 12-yard line, so let's find out who's guilty here. Our referee, Donnell Leathers. Doing the return, illegal block in the back. On the return team, number 10, half the distance from the spot of the foul, first down. So Brian Jenkins, irate, is probably more unhappy about the score. The Rattlers have the rock. We'll return and see what they do. ESPN's College Football is presented by McDonald's. I'm loving it. Bam, you leading Bethune 7-0 here in the 31st edition of the Florida Classic. And when you talk about Florida and them and their alumni, it looks like a who's who list. It starts with Bob Hayes, who was an Olympic gold medalist. And in fact, Bob Hayes was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2009. Another football standout was Ken Riley. He was a four-time pro bowler with the Cincinnati Ringles. And FAMU can also boast a couple of baseball greats in Andre Dawson, an eight-time All-Star, who was also an eight-time Gold Glove winner, and Vince Coleman, who was the 1985 National League Rookie of the Year. While at FAMU, Coleman was also a kicker and a punter on the football team, Dave. All right, man, I'm the Hawk made it to the Hall of Fame this year, as a matter of fact. So Andre Dawson, yeah. part of the great Rattler legacy. Meantime, trainer throwing from his own end zone, and I'll tell you one thing, second down and 10 coming up. You can't knock Florida A&M for being passive. Charlie, how about Althea Gibson in Florida A&M? Well, Florida A&M is located in the capital city of Tallahassee, founded in 1887, over 13,000 students enrolled. The only publicly funded HBCU in the state of Florida, and another alumni includes Althea Gibson. She's the first African-American woman to win a Grand Slam tennis title. It was the French Open. She did it in 1956. Yeah. Gentlemen? Uh, how about Vince Coleman, though? All that speed on the base, base paths, and he's a kicker and a punter? I'm how, guessing. How yeah. about some wide out a corner or something? Or how about returning the kicks? <laughs> Three-yard gain that time for the Rattlers. And that's Philip Sylvester, who came into the game needing 148 for 3,000 in his career. Daniel Rhodes in on the stop for the Wildcats. Yeah. 
So we'll see what Austin Trainer in just his third start, a redshirt freshman from out of Tallahassee. That is, as Charlie mentioned, the home of Florida A&M. Trainer took over the job from Martin Uckpai. And the coaches have been very pleased with the way he's run the offense. And he finds a first down there. That's Antonio Lawrence with room to run. And he'll get outside the 35 before he's brought down there by Chris Perry, the free safety. And that's why Trainer is in the game now because he's a much better passer than what they had. And they needed to be much more balanced. They needed a passing game to complement their run game and Sylvester. And you can see him throw the ball. Antonio Lawrence just runs up, runs a curl route. Trainer's able to put it right on his numbers, and that's something this offense really needs in order to balance itself out. So a gain of 28. And back on the ground, and Sylvester slipped trying to make a cutback. The Bethune defense gave him nothing. It's going to be a loss of three that time. Cornelius Wheeler finally sat on him. The weather here in Orlando is absolutely beautiful, by the way. Temperature in the 70s today, not very humid, just an ideal day. And these being two Florida teams, this for them is nothing as far as they're not going to get tired. And the weather's not going to wear anybody down today. And a quick hitch out to the 40-yard line, a short gain. Isaac West, the senior from Tallahassee, in there on the sky catch. That's a gain of four. So it's going to set up third down and a good eight for FAMU. You know, Bethune, defensively, they want to come in. They want to be an attacking style of defense, but they, they're going to adjust to what FAMU's doing offensively. The problem that they've had all year is teams have been different than what they've scouted on video. So they came in with the mindset of being able to adjust and adapt to what FAMU's giving them. Good the coverage that time, right around midfield. Trying to get it to Kevin Elliott, who had that catch on the flea flicker, but no chance to squeeze that ball in. So for the first time today, we'll get a look at the number one punter in the MEAC, Brandon Holdren, who's a first-teamer. And a quick conversation with Austin Trainer and head coach Joe Taylor. Courtney Keith, top punt, re punt man in the MEAC, punt returner, standing around the 15-yard line. A little pressure there. End over end kick. And Keith saw a little bit of a gap and broke a couple of tackles and then maybe broke his own form and fell in the 30-yard line. A 49-yard punt with a 14-yard return. Bethune has punted twice. One of the highest scoring teams in FCS having a hard time finding their offense. Florida a and still holding on to a 7-0 lead over the Wildcats of Bethune-Cookman University. You know, over the years, Bethune-Cookman has had a number of players that have made their mark in the National Football League. Their lone Hall of Famer, though, is a young man by the name of Larry Little, who was an offensive lineman. Larry Little wasn't even drafted after his college career and signed as a free agent with San Diego of the old AFL, eventually being traded to Miami, where he played in three Super Bowls, winning two. In fact, Larry Little was named to five Pro Bowls, was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1993, and at one time, gentlemen, he was the coach of this Bethune-Cookman Wildcats football team. Yeah, every honor he got on the field, he earned. He was a fabulous, fabulous football player, and one of the real keys to Miami Dolphins' great run in the 1970s was Larry Little, and a fabulous offensive line, but Larry Little was a man on the field. <laughs> They go on the ground with Jonathan Molman, the fullback out of Orlando. And Charlie, who else? I know Bethune's had some other great athletes. Well, Bethune Cookman founded in 1904 by Mary McLeod Bethune, located in Daytona Beach, Florida, and has an enrollment of over 4,000 students. But one of its most notable alumni is the former Temple University and Hall of Fame basketball coach, John Cheney. His first collegiate coaching job was at another HBCU school, Cheney State, a Division II school, where he won a national championship in 1978. Jackie Wilson, thank you, Charlie. Jackie Wilson back in the game at quarterback already. This is his second carry. He gets it just shy of the marker. Greg Harvey came up from his strong safety position to make the stop. 
And looks like they're going to mark him almost a full yard short. Well, they run this no huddle offense and they spread you out, but they really want to run the ball. They are a 65% run team. They average 236 yards rushing a game, and that's what they want to do. They want to come out, they want to pound the football, and then work the play action passes off of that. And Bethune leaves the MEAC in third down conversions around 44%, but they're 0 for 2 so far today. And we have the first timeout taken. And of course, we got another incredible group of games on Saturday Night Football presented by Southwest Airlines tonight on ABC at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. The regional action most of the country will see Taylor Martinez and the number eight Nebraska Cornhuskers face number 19 ranked Texas A&M. Others will see number 25 Florida State take on Maryland or USC at Oregon State. Go to ESPN.com, search maps to find out where you can check out your game. So the Coons got two timeouts left. And there's part of the fun here. And if you think we're going away at halftime and not showing you the bands, you are mistaken. <laughs> yeah, usually the announcers, we if we get a little break at halftime, we run to the food lines. See if anybody today. brought any brownies or cookies. No, 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 no. We're not leaving the booth today to watch this incredible battle of the bands between these two schools. In fact, they had a, a meeting in the new arena in downtown Orlando last night. The battle of the bands. Matt Johnson back in at quarterback. And some nifty ball handling by Johnson helps get a first down. Once again, Jonathan Moment on the carry. So Bethune gets four and the first down. And just like that, Wilson is back in at quarterback number five. Now you got to be careful if you're fam new fam you at, at some point Wilson is going to throw the ball. You can't just think when he comes in it's all run. You mean now? And his arm pulled as he throw. Oh, what a great catch at the 20 yard line. Javon Reeves. They get the safety sucked up on the play action fake. It. You got it. Play pass. You see the play action the run fake there. The safeties are up in the line of scrimmage. And Reeves gets one on one outside. He uses that long body, 6 3, long arms. He's able to go up and pluck that ball out of the air. That's only the 15th pass that Wilson has attempted all season long. Johnson back in at quarterback, and they run a jet sweep to Maurice Francois. Flag is down, and Francois makes it to the pylon, but we've got a penalty marker back at the 22-yard line. They're officially an eight-yard gain if it holds up. It will not. Well, oddly enough, we've now seen a third quarterback because Francois started the season as plate quarterback of Bethune, now listed as a wide receiver. But they lose on the holding call. Yeah, and you going back to that play down the field to Reams, Bethune feels like they they match up very well. Their receivers on Florida AM's cornerbacks, even though those corners are very good cover guys, they feel like they can make some plays down the field on those guys. And now first down and 20. That's a common sight with a lot of spread offenses, rushing the line of scrimmage, then stopping to get the play. Johnson, quick toss, caught 25, and just shy of the first down. Catch made by Maurice Francois, his 14th grab of the year, and Keir Hall, a first team all MEAC corner, and the co number one tackler for the Rattlers. That's a game of. Probably about nine. Yeah. Yeah. And a good, good, quick read by Matt Johnson and a good, quick throw. He read the man coverage with the pressure and got rid of the ball. And that's what makes him so good. He lives in the film room, a good student, very smart kid, student of the game. And he can run, too. Makes a wide open at the five-yard line. A great decision by Johnson. Going to be just shy of getting into the end zone. The catch made by Pat Brown, number 12. 
And, and normally when you have a quarterback that runs as well as Johnson, once he takes off, he's just all run. But Johnson does a good job keeping his eyes down the field, his head up, and is able to find Pat Brown wide open over the middle of the field. And that shows you his maturity as a quarterback. Lowering his head, and nope, the officials say runner did not make it. They gave it to Isidore Jackson, and he was stopped. So they take Jackson out, bring in Jonathan Moman to the fullback position. They'll try a power eye. No problem in standing up. So Bethune answers the early FAMU score. But the kicking game is always interesting with Bethune. The PAT is up and it is missed. The kicking game has been a problem for Bethune all season. That was Troy Kowalski. They've had a hard time with field goals. They've had a hard time with extra points. And they trail despite a 69-yard eight-play drive in three minutes and 23 seconds. That's been the problem, and you always wonder. Now, Bethune has had some games where they've just blown teams right out of the water. They've also had some games that maybe a, a kick or two would have made it closer. You wonder if this is going to bite them if they get to the FCS playoffs. And that's why Coach Jenkins was just talking to him right there, trying to keep his confidence up and say, hey, we're going to need you at some point down the line. That's the eighth missed PAT for Bethune as we go to the field and Charlie Neal. Well, one of the things I watched Kowalski in the pregame warm-ups just kicking extra points and he was horrendous he was hitting the left up right he had a couple go through but for the most part he did not have a good pregame yeah it's one of those things you all know, just almost I'm sure some people reflexively just sort of look away when they they line up in the BA team and don't do it when the Wildcats line up and they you know as a result they've been forced to go for two more than most teams around the country would do That's not a particularly great kickoff. That's going to be a penalty. And Kowalski struggling a bit. That's going to put the ball to the 40-yard line. A little pushing and shoving going on after the play. And that's not always a huge surprise when you get a game with intense rivalries. And much like a, a Miami FSU or a Florida Florida State or a UCF USF game, needless to say, these athletes probably recruited by both schools. They brought a lot of them played high school again. Probably a lot of played flag against yeah. each other. Some rivalries out there. But the kicking game is definitely an issue for Bethune Cookman, and not only just on field goals, but when you give up great field position like they're doing right now because he kicks it out of bounds, puts your defense in a very tough spot. And, you know, that obviously hasn't killed them this year because they're undefeated, but as the competition gets better and into the playoffs, you've got to think that that special teams segment has got to be a concern. And now how about a reverse and there's some room to run here for Antonio Lawrence bounces off his own blocker and he will get a first down to the Bethune Cookman 49 yard line. So Joe Taylor and his offensive staff just opening up the playbook here. And that's a good thing especially when you get an aggressive defense that is really rallying to the ball. You can see all the black jerseys going to the ball. Now they just run the reverse to Lawrence. He's got some room to run, runs into his own man out there, but it's still a big game for him. Play action for Trainer, And he has wide open. The tight end out to the 33-yard line, Max Purcell. A senior from Orlando, his seventh catch on the year. And a good job again by Trainer. You know, they've come out, they've given, given him some throws early, got him settled down, got him comfortable. Here's a play action boot to his left, keeps his eyes down the field and does a good job of squaring his shoulders up and hitting Purcell right on the numbers. 
So you see the disadvantage of losing that kickoff out of bounds. Only two plays, and they're already at the 33-yard line. Trainer, four out of six for 95. On the ground, the flag comes in behind the play. Sylvester, no game. Reggie Sandilands, a second-team All-MEAC, and the reigning MEAC Player of the Week defensively on the stop. That's a loss of two, and we'll see the penalty. Back it up, make it make it first down and 20. Jerry and Moreland, a former UCF Golden Knight, guilty of that holding call. With, with the style of offense that they have, and they run a lot of zone read stuff, so those big offensive linemen, they've got to be able to move also in space, and they've got a huge line. Moreland, 6'5", 320, he gets the holding call, but... You know, all those guys are 315, 320 up there. Huge offensive line. And with this style, they have to move their feet also. Sometimes they get caught short. Trainer. And down caught at the 20 yard line. Receiver went up and got that. He did not waste any time. Isaac West. He was very aggressive in chasing down that football. That'll be a first down after a 26 yard gain. And, and Trainer's done a good job so far in this first quarter throwing the ball. Again, just a little play action fake, but just looks the safety off in the middle of the field just to open up a little room for Isaac West and puts it right on the money in front of the corner. And then you see the free safety coming over late. That's a good read and a good throw, good timing by Austin Trainer. Oh, what a play by Sandlin in the backfield of the 20-yard line. That's going to be a loss of two. He almost interrupted the exchange between Trainer and Sylvester. Sandlin's an aggressive play from the linebacker spot. He's got 11 tackles for losses coming into this game. He's a guy that comes a lot off the edges, both he and Ryan Lewis. Those guys come off the edges quite a bit, bring a lot of pressure. That time he was able to run down Sylvester in the backfield. Second and a dozen. That pass should have been caught underneath. We'll set up third down and 12. TJ Lawrence was the intended receiver. The ball might have come out of there a little too hard. You know, trainer's got to take a little bit off of it when he's throwing those short crossing routes or the check downs. Take a little bit off of it. Don't throw those fastballs. Might have been completed. Trainer on the 18-yard line. This is Lawrence, and he finds a hole in the defense to get the first down. That's down to just shy of the five-yard line. Ozzie Slater finally brought him down, but that is a 14-yard pickup and another Rattlers first down. Yeah, and they just call this the, a China route where the outside receiver, Lawrence, he just stands there. The number two receiver in the slot will run a corner route and take the safety in the corner deep, and now you just throw it outside and makes one guy miss. Now he gets up the field and enough for a first down. However, they are not fooling anybody with the run game right now, JC. What is Femu not doing? Well, <laughs> here it's more of what Bethune Cookman is doing, and they're stacking the line of scrimmage, they're loading the box, taking away Sylvester in the run, and making Trainer beat him with, with his arm. And that was the game plan. Get up the field, don't let the running game get going at all especially with Sylvester so they're going to be up at the line of scrimmage making it tough to run the guy who's really making it hard for the run is Reggie Sandilands number 11 who's just been all over this fam you wants to be balanced right now though 134 passing yards and just 15 on the ground and a timeout called for by Austin trainer if you're wondering, the FAMU kicking game a little steadier than Bethune. Trevor Scott is 9 of 13 in field goals, as long as it's 47. Obviously, we're not in that situation. He's much closer, and he's made all but three of his 23 PATs. But that's why we had the one-point difference. Bethune was able to get down the field and score a touchdown, but missed the point after touchdown. I mean, that's been a problem of theirs all season long. It's a very simple formula for Bethune. 
Get out of here with a win. Jump on the bus. Go back to Daytona an hour south of here. And you take the MEAC title with you. But if you don't and Florida A&M wins this game, then we've got a little bit of uh, interesting chaos in the MEAC standings. Yeah, and you saw that stat that was just on the, on the screen. Florida A&M already 134 yards passing. That's more than they average a game all season. They came in only averaging 130 yards passing. So getting it done through the air right now. And there you see the situation that we walked in today. If you were with us early, Charlie Neal went through this, but it's certainly worth mentioning again. Bethune having one of the greatest seasons in their football history. They are the only undefeated team in the top 25 of the FCS poll. They're number seven in that poll. And the Sheridan poll for the historically black colleges, they are number one. But at the moment, they are not number one in this game. And trainer on the rollout gets a dart in there. And Lawrence breaks the tackle and scores. <laughs> so trainer's second touchdown pass of the season. And Lawrence's third touchdown reception, and FAMU is an extra point away from an eight-point advantage. And you see him flexing his muscles right there. He just ran through <laughs> two tacklers. That's got to kill you as a DB. What, what yeah. is it with the DBs not tackling? Yeah, you got to wrap up. Well, you know what? Maybe the muscle flex cost him because that unsportsmanlike conduct penalty going against Florida A&M. Still doesn't excuse the missed tackle, <laughs> but no, and they had two guys out there and missed the tackle. Looked like actually it was going to be a big hit. Mm -hmm. Turns out that Antonio Lawrence just ran through it. So the penalty will be enforced on the kickoff. So it should be good field position for Bethune. And there's a flag down here on the PAT. So just hang on a second. Tell you one thing's really interesting as we await the result of this. Bethune came in here only allowing 16 first quarter points. He's going to have 14 if this holds up. This PAT is good. So that so means you should be kicking off yeah, at the 40, yeah. am I right? It, uh, they just, they offset themselves. So the unsportsmanlike on FAMU and now the personal foul on Bethune but going back to the touchdown you're going to see it looks like number six out of the slot watch it looks like he's going to take a big shot right here but nobody wraps up everybody just lowers a shoulder and Lawrence does a good job of not thinking that he's going to be tackled and just keeps fighting and he just stands up and that's Daniel Rhodes number 27 the corner just drops his shoulder no arms no wrap anything they allow Lawrence to get into the end zone. It's interesting, just looking at the raw numbers of these two teams, Bethune averaging over 41 points a game by a little bit, and Florida A&M barely over 20, and yet it's been Florida A&M with a couple of touchdown drives, one very short one, uh, just two plays and 56 yards in that last drive. So we're back to the 30-yard line where we were going to kick off without the penalties. And that's why, you know, in these rivalry games, you can throw all the stats out. It doesn't matter because, like you said, they, a lot of these kids know each other. It's a huge game no matter what, and they're both going to bring their A game. This will be Preston Cleckley. And I tell you what, that is the third kickoff return the Rattlers have covered brilliantly. Only a 13-yard return. I think the longest they've had so far has been 14. Now, you mentioned the FCS standings. And let's take a look. There you see Bethune, team highlighted there, number seven. Delaware is number one. The Blue Hens once again having another spectacular season. Appalachian State, now they're struggling in the swamp today, but you kind of figured that was yeah. going to happen. You can live with that. The Red Turf sitting there at number three. School that almost had Kellen Moore. The Boise State, believe yeah. it or not. Yeah, the red turf. Have you seen that turf? Yeah. That is uh, not in person. Yeah, it looks a little wild on TV. 
And Johnson gets the quick toss out to the 20-yard line. And we're going to be a little shy of the first down. Javon Reams. Anthony Shutt, number 36, one of the tacklers there. That should be just short of the first down. It's an eight-yard pickup, so he's got two to go. Uh, gentlemen, you were talking about the FCS and how important this particular game is. You know, they've expanded the FCS playoffs this year to 20 teams. We'll talk a little bit more about it after this play. And once again, Charlie, we see Jackie Wilson in the quarterback spot. He did have one significant throw, but he loves to run the football. And you see why he's got an opportunity here for a major gain in the Florida a and territory. The collision at the 37-yard line for Jackie Wilson. Curtis Holcomb shoved him out of bounds. That's a 40-yard pickup. Just the inside zone read by Wilson. He's just going to read one guy. He sees that the defense overcommits, so he keeps the ball. And then a great cut back right there to avoid a defender. And now he's just down the field. But, but that's what he brings to this team. That's why he's in 215 pounds, so a little bit bigger, stronger guy than Matt Johnson. Yeah, Johnson 5'10", 175. Not much there at all on the carry by Isidore Jackson. Really no gain, as a matter of fact. Gang tackled by the interior of the Florida A&M defense. And that might be the final play of what's been a very entertaining first quarter, to say the least. Let's we'll see if Johnson tries to sneak in a quick snap before the quarter break. And he does. Johnson under pressure from the backside. And he is going to elude that and throw it away. Right as the clock turns to zero to signify the end of the first quarter, Kendrick Washington was putting on enormous pressure but Johnson was able to elude him. Right now, Bethune-Cookman trying to remain unbeaten, but they're on the short end. Hardly happened to them all year long. ESPN Monday Night Football, Broncos Chargers at 8.30. It's here. As we start the second quarter, here you see Antonio Trainer to Antonio Lawrence. Lawrence breaking a couple of tackles into the end zone, and that made it 14 to 6, and that's the way we start the second quarter. Now let's go back upstairs to Dave and JC. All right, Charlie, thank you very much. Don't forget, we're going to be showing you the battle of these incredible bands. You see the numbers from Antonio Lawrence, what he was able to do so far. There's Matt Johnson, the MEAC Offensive Player of the Year. And second quarter about to begin with third down and ten. Takes a shot toward the end zone and oh what another great catch down to the three yard line. That is Javon Reams again his second outstanding grab of the afternoon. And again working on Curtis Holcomb number 24 they clear the safety out with the short crosser. Reams is able to get inside of Holcomb and they throw the ball inside. Holcomb can't get around that big body. 6'3", 200 pounds of Reams. He comes down with another big play. And once again, Jackie Wilson in that quarterback spot. Look out here. Wilson will try to do something, but he is surrounded by orange and green. That's a loss back to the 24-yard line, a 21-yard loss. Alvis Graham on the stop. And that is all on Jackie Wilson. Watch the snap just goes right through his hands. And there's no excuse for that. He's taken enough of those shotgun snaps. But again, you get a guy out there trying to do a little too much, trying to see what the defense is giving him because it looked like it was a designed run and he doesn't focus on catching the ball. And right down the middle of the field and they're going to get it right back. Unbelievable. Right back down to the two yard line. That's Pat Brown on the catch and they just got back to 21. They lost. And now they bring Jackie Wilson back in and you have to think that you know they don't want Matt Johnson to take a lot of hits because he does this so well throws the ball all over the field gets it right back down in scoring territory now they bring Wilson back in Andros Bell is the tailback number eight and he collides with Wilson and Wilson's going to be short of the first down what about this this idea of changing the quarterbacks all the time you on board with that well Matt Johnson leads him in rushing for the entire year but he's 
not a big guy, 5'10", 175 pounds. And when you look around the country, guys like Denard Robinson at Michigan and how banged up they get. And then if you lose them with an injury, well, now you're in a tough situation. So I think they're trying to limit the pounding that Matt Johnson takes on his body. They're going to go for a fourth down and goal. And across the end line for the touchdown is Bell. The Wildcats this year have converted 41% of their fourth downs. And they bring the kicking team on the field. Yeah, I'm surprised they don't go for two here since they missed the first extra point. Surprised they don't go for two here. Well, maybe next time they will. Because the difference in this game is the fact that Corey Kowalski has missed both point after touchdowns. However, a drive where Bethune lost 21 yards, regained the 21 on the next play, and then Andros Bell able to drive it in on fourth and goal. Rock hard. 14 to 12, the score here in the second quarter of the 31st edition of the Florida Classic. You're looking at the Bethune Cookman Marching Band. They call themselves the Marching Wildcats, also the Pride. They're 325 strong, and they feature the sophisticated flat core, 14 karat gold dancers, and the band is under the direction of Donovan Wells. And Thursday night, you can catch the final two episodes of the battle on ESPNU, and where you can get an inside look at the HBCU Marching Band world of Bethune, Cookman, and Florida and m The show goes on to further into the training, discipline, heart, and soul of the competition that are the classics. The battle presented by AT&T on ESPNU. The final two episodes starting Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. And I'll tell you, it's a cross-stadium battle going on between the bands right now. Yeah, I tell you, the action on the field is just as good as the action in the stands or vice versa. As off of the kickoff Florida a will have great field position to the 38 yard line Jarrell Stewart taking it out there and again the difference in this game a couple of missed PATs by Bethune so Austin trainer will lead the Rattlers offense out how do you think of him so far the coach has made that change this is just his third start he's looked very well throwing the ball made some big plays down the field and now I think that Bethune Cookman defensively has got to make some adjustments they came in wanting to load the box and stop Sylvester and make trainer throw the ball but trainers really hurt them throwing the ball so I think they've got to rethink what they're doing right now and make sure they don't give up any more big plays down the field. That's our first look at Eddie Rocker from the tailback position he gets a maybe a yard where he was wrestled down. Uh, Rock Engrand in there out of Port St. Lucie a little south of Orlando redshirt freshman on the stop. And again, with Charlie has mentioned the bands, you'll see them at halftime. We would not consider depriving you of that. All right, Sam, you picked up a stunt beautifully, and trainer missing on the mark that time, trying to get it to Kevin Elliott. It's going to be third down and nine. Yeah, and the, the pressure got to him there at the end, just from the inside pocket kind of collapsing. But again, they've got guys down the field that, that are running open. If trainer has time to throw the ball, he's shown that he has the ability to hit those guys. So Bethune's got to decide either we're going to bring the pressure and hopefully we can get to him, or now we've got to play more coverage. Thirty two percent third down conversion rate for FAMU but the two of three today. And trainer takes the option where Elliott is going to have to get the first down on his own and he didn't make it. Daniel Rhodes who had a tough time tackling on the touchdown was able to make that open field stop and it appears that he's going to be a yard and a half short. Pretty close but the offense right now is still on the field they haven't made a decision now. Looks like they're going to decide to punt the ball away, which is smart in this situation. So Brandon Holdren 
Not much of a wind, a little bit of a breeze maybe in Brandon's face right now, but nothing drastic. Courtney Keith, almost a 15-yard punt return average. And he just takes out a little wedge. Just try to hit a little bite wedge, and he did a great job. That's going to bounce outside the 20 to the 21-yard line, but he kept it away from the top punt returner in the MEAC and Courtney Keith. So Matt Johnson and Jackie Wilson and the Bethune offense get a chance to perhaps take the lead. Florida a &M with a two-point lead over Bethune-Cookman here in the second quarter. And you're looking at the Florida a &M marching band. They're known as the Marching 100. And they have a penchant for precision, which is demonstrated in every aspect of its performance. Over 400 members, Dr. Julian White is the director. Now, he succeeded Dr. William Foster, who directed the band for over 50 years. Dr. Foster passed away this past August. And before the day's game, the band honored the memory of Dr. Foster by spelling out his name in a pregame ceremony. Dr. William Foster, who was a longtime innovator as far as HBCU bands. Gentlemen. Yeah, the marching 100 times four. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Everybody asked that, you know, how do you get the name marching 100? They got 400 strong, but at one time they were only 100, I guess. Uh, they are world renowned, as is the Bethune band. And that's coming up at halftime. But right now, the FAMU defense and Greg Harvey making the big play. That's going to maybe lose a yard. We'll see where they finally put the ball down. They do indeed take a yard off the total. So it's going to be second down and 11. I'm Dave Lamont, JC Pearson. We're upstairs, and Charlie Neal is on the field, keeping an eye on things there. Maybe you brought the blitz, and it's going to be Johnson. And he took a look at that, J.C., and decided maybe the 21 was a better place to go than the 22 as Curtis Holcomb came up to support. And a smart play also by Johnson. You know, we've talked all game about how he's not a big guy, only 5'10", 175. And he, you, want to, you don't want to take any unnecessary shots, get as many yards as you can get, get out of bounds or get down on the ground because he's too valuable to this team to risk in injury to a five and third down conversion so far for Bethune. And is he inbounds is the question. No is the answer. Great catch made along the sideline but Eddie Poole not able to get a foot down and so Bethune will have to punt and Corey Kowalski and he's had a rather traumatic day as a kicker. He's hooked the kickoff out of bounds. He's missed a couple of extra points. We'll see what he can do with a punt. And you got to think the confidence right now for him has got to be a, a big issue and he can hit a good one here. It, it might help him the rest of the game. And this is a pretty good one starting to drift out of bounds and it will do so at the 42 yard line so the Rattlers have outstanding field position they have the lead and they're standing in the way for Bethune Cookman trying to complete an undefeated season and win the MEAC. There's your score in time the Florida Classic in Orlando and downtown. It all comes down to the final race of the season as the championship is on the line in a winner-take-all battle between Denny Hamlin, Jimmy Johnson, and Kevin Harvick for the NASCAR Sprint Cup Championship. The chase finishes with the Ford 400 at Homestead Miami Speedway tomorrow at 1 Eastern on ESPN. Coverage begins with NASCAR Countdown at noon Eastern on ESPN2. Casey Kane has captured the pole. Jimmy Johnson, of course, trying to get a remarkable fifth consecutive Sprint Cup Championship. But if Denny Hamlin wins or finish second and leads the most laps, he'll get out of there and break J.J.'s mark. Trainer, quick hitch, caught 47-yard line. And it's a gain of seven, catch made by Isaac West. And, you know, Florida A&M did not come in here with an explosive offense, J.C., and Bethune's defense, one of the best in FCS. But so far, the Rattlers have moved the ball pretty well. They've done a great job throwing the ball, and that's really opened up this offense for them. You can see already far surpassing their, their per-game average on the entire season. And the points is the biggest thing, of course, 
they're already at 14 and they've only averaged 20 all year long so they're doing a great job offensively so far and they go on the ground however with Sylvester and this is the part of the balanced equation that they can't get right right now yeah. Bethune is just swarming their run game and then they, they wanted that was their thing coming in make sure that the running game and Sylvester doesn't get going they've given up some some plays through the air but I think that they'll live with trainer and being a young quarterback and having to rely on his arm than a guy like Sylvester who is coming in has five straight 100 yard rushing games and they're on a five game winning streak because of it. Yeah, Sylvester is averaging less than a yard a carry although he does have a 90 yard touchdown run. Here comes a blitz. That's going to really mess up his yards per carry average as Bethune again. It almost appears as if it's one of those team rush things, it's, yeah. <laughs> but it's not. They bring them all. Bring them every gap. They're bringing seven, eight guys in. Florida A&M just doesn't have enough guys to block. And you can see as soon as Sylvester gets the ball, there's three, four black jerseys on him. And what that blitz does, not only is it a great run blitz, but now if it's a pass, well, now those guys are up the field and in trainer's face also. So how do you counter that? You got to get rid of it quick. You got to see it coming and blitz adjust. And that took a wild bounce and the Wildcats were fortunate no one on their team touched it because Florida and M would have gotten an enormous break with the ball down at the 34 yard line instead. It's a punt of 32 yards by Brandon Holdren. Monday night football. The Denver Broncos of Kyle Orton and the San Diego Chargers of Philip Rivers. 8.30 Eastern on ESPN. Great matchup. And don't forget, it all begins at 7 o'clock with Monday Night Countdown served by Applebee's. That AFC West looked like it was going to be one of the worst divisions in the NFL at first, but now it's really tightened up. San Diego, Denver had a big win last week against Kansas City. The Raiders are playing well, so now it looks like it could be one of the strongest. In the battle for the MEAC, it is Jackie Wilson's running straight ahead, and he's taking the punishment. And that's a gain of almost nine. In fact, it will be considered a nine-yard gain for the sophomore from Fort Lauderdale. And he took a shot around the neck. And he is, unfortunately, still on the field. And we got a pretty good look here, JC, of what just happened to Jackie Wilson. And watch him just again that inside zone read and watch at the end of the play. There, it looks like he takes a knee to the helmet. John Ojo's, I think John Ojo, number 25, his right knee may have gotten him in the, in the side of the helmet. Watch at the end right here, that right knee. Looks like it may have gotten him up around the head area. And Jackie Wilson has been a key component so far as a running quarterback. And he hit one long pass. Now it's like they're looking at a leg. But I, initially, you could see the hit to the head. Wilson's run for 50 yards already. And is two for two for 44 yards passing. He's actually accounted for more yards than Matt Johnson, believe it or not. And, and they told us when we met with them and talked to him on the phone that he was going to be a big part today. They had a special package built just for Jackie Wilson today, and you can see why. I mean, very talented young man. And very happy to report that he's up, and hopefully he'll be able to get off the field under his own power and get back into the game. So he took it high and low there. Took a shot to the, to the head, and then also either a knee or an ankle. So it's going to be second down and about a yard for the senior from Fort Lauderdale, Matt Johnson. And they'll keep it on the ground. First down. That's Jonathan Moment across to the 47-yard line. So we'll take a look at what has happened with Bethune using the two quarterbacks today. Jackie Wilson, primarily the running quarterback. Matt Johnson, more the guy that's been throwing the football today. And it's pretty even. No, there's your offensive balance. Yeah, no question. Between those two guys, and you know, Jackie Wilson, the bigger, stronger guy, they want to use him more in the running game. And, and Johnson is sacked. First one of those we've had today. 
Jerry Willis, number 98, with three and a half sacks on the season. That's going to be a loss of six. The junior from Chicago. And if they can get pressure on him, see, they just run a stunt. And everybody comes to the inside gap, and then Jerry Willis just pops through there. The last second is able to come up with the sack. Out of the flat. And this is a good idea. Why not let your receiver run a little bit? That's going to be a first down for Javon Reams into FAMU territory. A gain of 24 on the play before Ojo pushes him out of bounds. And Dave, you were asking, how do you beat the blitz? Well, FAMU blitzes on this particular play, but Johnson sees it, gets rid of the ball quickly, and now they're able to make a big play. That was the sack prior to. That wasn't the last play. And a quick hitter across the 35 to the 33-yard line. But again, getting back to my point, Dave, when you have a team that is bringing a lot of pressure and you know that you don't have enough guys to pick it up, you have to read it. Your outside guys have to read it and blitz adjust, give you a quick, easy throw. And that's how you beat the pressure. Second down, six Johnson with time, throws a dart, caught on the 20-yard line, and the knee touched at the 21. So, the catch made by Eddie Poole, his first grab of the day. It's a gain of a dozen, and another Bethune first down. We get word from the sideline that they're looking at Jackie Wilson's ankle. And we hope that he gets the opportunity to come back into the game for the Wildcats. In the meantime, nothing wrong with what Matt Johnson is doing. And you can see the tempo has, has picked up for them offensively. But it didn't slow FAMU down as they went for the fake, and Johnson did a nice job to keep it outside. He attract, and there's a very late flag. Call on the stop, and not sure. Something had to be said for this flag because there was nothing untoward. Now, Bethune is... First of all, defense, number seven. Down. All right, that's Willie Farrell, and let's see if we can look again if we get an opportunity to show you what he must have said something because I believe you saw him go by the official. All right, so let's take a look at look at the top left of your screens at home, folks. Number seven. There he is. It's just a shot after the play. Well, inside the five-yard line, Farrell, their number seven, was able to make the ankle tackle of Isidore Jackson. The great irony is that the team has been plagued all year by penalties has been Bethune. Well, they both have been plagued. Yeah. You know, FAMU comes in averaging nine penalties a game, and Bethune averages 10.7 10 penalties a game. So penalties have been an issue for both teams. Bethune only a couple of them today, though. Yeah, 107 penalties against Bethune this year, and they're unbeaten. So you got some talent. They keep it on the ground, and this time stuffed, and you can see Farrell in there again. Maybe a yard. So his play inspired after being hit with that unsportsmanlike conduct for our personal foul penalty, actually. You see where the football is. So it's going to be third and goal. Well, Sam has been good all year long in the red zone and not allowing touchdowns. The teams have been in the red zone 31 times and only 12 touchdowns, so... FAMU's done a good job of not breaking once they get down in the red zone. Johnson throws the fade, and the ball is still. There's another flag that came in, it looks like. Let's see what the call is. Eddie Poole is the receiver. Hall on the coverage. I always love having the former defensive back that uh, turn over look at these plays. Well, they just run the fade at the top of the screen and you see a lot of hand pushing on both sides, but they're always going to get the defender for that. Poole was also pushing, but Hall got a little jersey at the end right there. See that left hand on the jersey. Anytime you have that much contact, they're going to call it on the defensive back. First and goal. 
Straight ahead and into the end zone. Isidore Jackson. And for the first time today, Bethune has the lead. And they're going to trot out Kowalski again. You always have to be leery of a fake. Well, there you go. One out of three. The 333 batting average is good enough for baseball, which is <laughs> better than that in football. Yeah. But Corey Kowalski pops one through, and hopefully that'll give him the confidence boost that he may well need. It's a pretty simple play here. Nothing to it. Yeah, just the inside lead power run. See right here, just an inside zone play allows Jackson just to try to find a crease. Gets into the end zone. Just an easy run, easy play, all set up by the pass interference call. You saw a beautiful block by Natil Curry, the all first team MEAC center for Bethune, who just obliterated the FAMU defender. Meantime, Brian Jenkins showing some speed going up the sideline. He's all over the field, man, up and down that sideline, talking to every unit before they come on the field. Got a lot of energy over there. Well, if you're 10-0, you probably run a little faster than if you're 0-10. And, and you see the difference in Bethune. They got a very sluggish start, but not the case the last four drives with three touchdowns and one out of three extra points. And this is the Bethune as advertised that we've seen in this quarter. So Stewart and Sylvester back deep for the Rattlers. And this will be Stewart of the six. Oh, what a play in special teams for Bethune. And normally FAMU have been the ones making the great plays, but for Bethune that time, that was Preston Cleckley who came flying in with the ankle tackle. Well, we promised this to you, and we're dead serious about it. Coming up at halftime on the State Farm Halftime Report, a battle of the band, the Marching Wildcats and the Marching 100. We'll also take a look at the first half highlights and some numbers, and J.C. will have his thoughts on this first half. If Bethune wins this game, they are the MEAC champions. If not, then we start getting into what-ifs and maybes and could-bes and tiebreakers and all sorts of things. Trainer in trouble was able to get rid of it before he was decked, but it's going to be incomplete second down and ten. But as we showed you at the front of the show, Bethune Cookman only FAMU standing in the way of them finishing a regular season unbeaten. Florida A&M is hopeful that, hey, if they can win this game, they maybe get a bid to the FCS playoff. It's possible the MEAC sends a couple of teams. And by the way, we can't forget about South Carolina State, always a traditional power. They're playing North Carolina A&T today. And if South Carolina State wins and FAMU wins, then we go to Charlie and go, Charlie, what do we do now? Yeah, yeah. And that game is going on as we speak. Trainer, shoulder fake on the play action, and this one's incomplete. And the FAMU bench wants interference, but Charlie, they're not going to get it. No, they're not going to get it. And you were talking about what happens if it's a three-way tie, South Carolina State, FAMU, and Bethune Cookman. If Bethune loses to Florida and m well, Bethune would go because of the point system, even though all teams would have one conference loss. Now, Bethune beat South Carolina State in head-to-head -head competition. Florida and m would have beaten Bethune, but because of the point totals they get for playing non-conference division, one AA schools or FCS schools, it would give Bethune Cookman the edge. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Two out of five on third down for the Rattlers. Lobbing it in there and intercepted at the 48-yard line and then dropped. In and out of the hands of Ozzy Slater. But Bethune holds. That's a good series for Bethune defensively. They brought pressure on the first two downs and really got the trainer, hit them both times. And now they drop into coverage. And you can see trainer just throws that ball up for grabs again into double coverage and almost intercepted. But the ball just comes out. That was Ozzie Slater, number 21. Good job playing the ball in the air. But that's a, that's a ball he's got to catch. Mm -hmm. 
Fair catch called for here and made at the 40 yard line. And he actually did have that and the collision with the teammate caused him to go out of bounds and lose the football. A 37 yard punt with Thune with excellent field position at their own 40 yard line. We'll take and defensively they they've really started to buckle down and settle down and play better. You take away the big plays that they gave up early in the game on the throwback and things like that. Other than that, they've really started to play good defense defensively. We are at the Citrus Bowl in downtown Orlando. And this is the Florida Classic. The 31st Florida Classic, but not the 31st meeting between these schools. Johnson, and that's Eddie Poole. And he has wrestled down a perfect tackle by Keir Hall. Our weather in Orlando, we hit the 80 degree mark. A little bit of cloud cover, but no threat of rain. Kind of breezy on the field. And I'm Dave Lamont along with J.C. Pearson. We are upstairs and on the field of the Citrus Bowl is Charlie Neal. And Charlie's going to walk you through what we know is going to be an incredible halftime show with the Battle of the Bands here at the Florida Classic. FAMU has dominated the series over the life of the series. 47 wins, just 15 losses, and a tie. Not much there for Bell, but Bethune-Cookman came into this game 10-0, 7-0 in the MEAC, and trying to win the MEAC title outright would be their first since 2002. Brian Jenkins, the MEAC Coach of the Year, has proven to be an energetic presence <laughs> on the sidelines, to say the least. Coaching everything, special teams, offense, defense, and I don't know where the coordinators are, but uh, <laughs> he, he's taking control of everything. He may direct the band. And Johnson hesitated. Flags come flying in. Poole is brought down about a foot short of the first down, just shy of midfield. This flag came in from the Florida A&M sideline, so let's see what the call is. Elvis Graham is in on the stop. Well, there you go. Now, we mentioned the penalties in Bethune have been partners this year. This is the one category you don't want to lead your conference in. So that's only three penalties for 35 yards, however, for the Wildcats and Bethune-Cookman University. Yeah, they came into the game today with 935 yards in penalties, almost 1,000 <laughs> yards in penalties. And, you know, when you see a stat like that, it's surprising. I'm surprised to see that they're undefeated because when you, you have penalties like that and your kicking game is as bad as their kicking game is today, you know, I'm surprised that they're not losing games. And hold on, we have quite a bit of timeout called. Let's make sure. Timeout, Florida and Yeah, the Rattlers called their second timeout. By the way, you think it's been a bit of a drought for Bethune. Florida A&M's last MEAC title was 2001. And the very first meeting between these two schools, you got to go back to 1925, long before there was a Florida Classic, almost long before there was an Orlando. Uh, there was uh, the meetings between these schools. So this is a rivalry that runs deep in this state. And you've got alums all over every corner of Florida. And there you see the history between these schools. Last year, FAMU with an easy win, 42 to 6. But right now, Bethune in front, 19 to 14. Charlie? Yeah, well, one of the things you talk about, you know, 17 years, this Florida Classic was played in Tampa, Florida, right down the road, uh, maybe, what, two hours away from where we are, and then they moved it here, and it, it, it actually started to grow. And as we said earlier uh, in the contest, 73,000 was the record number of uh, people who came to watch this game uh, since it's moved here to Orlando. And a healthy attendance today, that's for sure. Pass a little bit underthrown. Flag comes in. Poole is the receiver. Marvin Ross was in coverage, and we've got another flag. And let's see who's guilty of interference here. Well, Ross never turned around to see the football. That's a dead giveaway. Pass interference. Defense. Number 13. 15 yards from the 
It's got to kill you, J.C., when you're yeah. on coverage and the quarterback underthrows the pass. I mean, he's in great coverage, number 13, Marvin Ross. You're going to see him in great coverage, but he never turns his head to play the football. He's in great position right here. If he turns his head, he can probably intercept the ball, but instead he's trying to play the eyes and the hands, and you see the contact right there on Eddie Poole. But, you know, normally when you get a corner that does that, there's not a lot of confidence there. you got to have confidence to be in position, turn your head, find the football, track it, and make a play on it. And he's in perfect position, probably should have gotten the interception. So the pass was ruled not caught on the field, so the penalty was enforced instead. The FAMU 49-yard line, and Andros Bell straight ahead, a senior from Palm Bay, Florida, the Melbourne area, for about three. And Pharrell on the stop. Well, a bad exchange and very, very safe decision by Bell just to eat it at midfield. So it's going to be third down and 11. And that's the third time that we've seen a bad exchange center quarterback and this ball is just a little to the left and again it looked like it surprises Johnson he's not ready to make the catch it's a little low and a little outside that's twice with him and, and once we've seen one go right through Jackie Wilson's hands and Johnson he'll try to get to the first down on his own big hitter coming up and Johnson avoided him and gets the first down to the 35 yard line that's a 15 yard pickup yeah, gutsy run by Matt Johnson. We've talked all day long about, you know, how he's not very big, but watch him right here. He's not going to slide, not going to run out of bounds, makes a guy miss, cuts right between two of them, and almost stays on his feet for another, you know, to continue running. Bethune with two timeouts as we're under two minutes in this half. And it'll be second down and 10. A little miscommunication. Receivers streaking down the field. And Matt Johnson throwing well behind him. But nobody got hurt on that one. So it's second and 10. Yeah, but that's one of those blitz adjustments that I was talking about. The receiver also has to read the blitz so he knows to break his route off. If the receiver's not reading blitz, quarterback reads blitz, he throws the ball out there where you're supposed to be. And you get what we just saw. Two receivers just running down the field. Johnson today, 9 of 23 for 129 yards. The FAMU really crowded the box that time. Poole breaks the tackle. He'll go into the end zone. Thirty five yards Matt Johnson and Eddie Poole and Poole ran through a tackle they cheated up and I even I noticed the safeties yeah. cheated up that time missed tackles though just like yeah. we saw Bethune Cookman missed tackle on the touchdown for FAMU to Antonio Lawrence now FAMU misses the tackles gives up a long touchdown pass to Eddie Poole and they've got 10 seconds to get this two-point conversion in or waste of timeout Brian Jenkins Looks like that's what he wants to do, not waste a timeout. I shouldn't say that. He will take a timeout and discuss the two-point conversion possibilities with his team. So let's go back one more time and take a look at Eddie Poole's touchdown catch. Just man coverage. They're bringing some pressure inside. And look at the missed tackles. Again, right there, you got to wrap up two guys. And there's another one there at the end, but there's no excuse for that. You've got to be able to make the tackles, just wrap up and hang on. You see, again, that's number 13, Marvin Ross, the guy that got victimized for the pass interference that got them down the field. Now he doesn't wrap up on the tackle and gives up the touchdown to Eddie Poole. Now Bethune had that terrible start, and they punted their first couple of possessions. Now they have scored in four of their last five drives, a team that came in averaging a hair over 41 points per game. You see how they have dominated this stretch in this quarter as FAMU offensively has grown cold while Bethune is rolling right through. A 
And now they'll try for two for the first time today. And Johnson back in the end zone, and it's cool. He accounts for eight points on that drive. A great poise there by Johnson. Not yeah. flustered by the rush at all. And Poole just actually runs a slant. Not open. Johnson buys some time here. Now Poole breaks his route off. Comes back and friendly with the quarterback. Johnson feeling the pressure. Gets out. You can see Poole at the back of the end zone. Breaks his route off. Comes back and gets friendly with the quarterback. That's what they call it. Get friendly to the quarterback and it's an easy throw and catch. When a play kind of breaks down like that and it becomes an improvisational situation for the offense, what's the defensive back's responsibility? You gotta, you gotta squeeze up. You gotta plaster. That means you gotta go and hug up on a guy. Find a receiver if you're playing zone. Hug up on him, and now you're essentially playing man to man. If you're in man coverage, you can't turn your head and lose him, and that's what happened there. Looks like Hall just turned his head and lost pool when he broke his route off. So a picture perfect second quarter for the Bethune offense and, and their defense in particular. They have taken over this game after a very slow start. Just the second time this year the Bethune trailed in a game against Hampton. And Charlie very familiar with that game. He called it. Uh, Bethune trailed in a game that I'm sure the Hampton people thought they should have won. But they turned the ball over too many times. And right now Florida A&M has got to figure out something in the next 93 seconds. And that is Antonio Lawrence or T.J. Lawrence with a good kick return out to around the 34-35 yard line. FAMU with just one timeout remaining. Now, why would we ever show you empty seats? Well, it's because they were belonging to the bands. We got a great attendance here today, too, so that's why those seats are empty. Coming up on our State Farm Halftime Report, it is the Battle of the Bands. The Marching Wildcats from Bethune, the Marching 100 from FAMU. And we'll also show you a little football as well, but you really don't want to go out to the store, go fill up the car full of air and gas. You want to watch this. Trainer finds an open man on the 40-yard line. That's Brian Times, a junior out of Fort Lauderdale. He gets it out to the 50-yard line. Slater on the stop. And the, we see somebody throw a, a little punch there, maybe? And they got away with it. No flags. So the soon trying to get enough bodies. They may not have him off the field in time. And Brian Jenkins just broke his headset. He threw it about 15 yards. And he is getting into it with one of his own coaches. And Bethune had to burn a timeout here to try to get the chaos off the field. Meantime, we think we spotted a uh, little action here. A little push. I've seen worse. We do have boxing coming up after our game. Yeah, yeah. That's just guys trying to get up. <laughs> guys trying to hold them down. In this situation, you're taught to keep the, the ball carrier on the ground, lay on him. The ball carrier, of course, is trying to get up as fast as he can because the clock is running. You get that sometimes, just some pushing and shoving. Maybe pushing and shoving in the coaches' offices of Bethune when this game is over with. Brian Jenkins, an emotional leader for this team. You know what? He's 10 and 0. And it's worked out. His approach, his very hands on approach, has certainly worked. FAMU in this quarter now 24 yards, 10 plays. That's it. While Bethune in their last five drives has put up 282 yards. <laughs> Training with a fade. Little opening here, though. And a gain of about six for Sylvester. Sandlin's on the stop again. He's been a real pest for the FAMU offense. Bethune out of timeouts, and the Rattlers have one. And that pass. Had three intended receivers that time. Mike Williams, who has four interceptions on the season already for Bethune, and is a first-team All-MEAC safety, almost picked up his fifth. Yeah, even though he's a second-teamer. Yeah. He's a first-team All-Conference performer. Just plays the ball, but that's a long throw for Trainer to make from the far hash. 
all the way to the boundary on the other side down the field. You've got to have a strong, strong arm to get that ball there in a hurry. And Trainer he gets it no problem there to get the first down and a lot more. A lot of extra yards after the catch by Isaac West. That will stop the clock with 39 seconds remaining. Daniel Rhodes finally dragged him down. It's a 19-yard pickup. Remember, the FAMU kicking game is in better shape than Bethune's if they need to go for three. Trainer and a receiver broke late or Trainer threw early. Uh, you tell me, Jason, yeah. that's incomplete. The timing was off. The receivers claiming that he was held out there, but he's got to get out of that break, get his head around. The trainer may have been a little early with that ball, too, but that's what pressure does to you. Second down and 10. Trainer 11 to 20 for 194 and a touchdown. And you see the difference between success and failure for the Rattlers. Trainer, a little pressure from the backside. Does a nice job. Flag is down. Looked very clearly to be a hold. That play doesn't get a whole heck of a lot, and that'll stop the clock with 20 seconds to go. It looked like Eddie Battle made that catch, number eight. And there you see the hold. We could see it from up here. So that'll back him up. Ten, a significant penalty. By the way, it's Florida A&M. Number 68, 10 yards from the previous spot. Replay second down. With a penalty problem today, 7 for 67. And there you go. So we all the talk about Bethune and their penalty ills, but right now it's been FAMU. Second and 20, trainer, and again a late break and a near pick. That's Deion Hanks who came in. Yeah, almost. And a good play by Hanks. You can see trainer just balls out a little late and just seeing it the whole way. You're playing zone coverage, so you're looking in at the quarterback and able to make a great jump on the ball. And Sam, you lucky that that didn't go the other way for six. You're thinking about a field goal. Trevor Scott's longest of the season for the Rattlers is 47. They're over 50 yards now. It'll be 52 if they can't do anything here with nine seconds. They'll take a shot deep down the field, and it's going to be overthrown and picked in the end zone. That'll end all thoughts of a field goal, and there is Mike Williams with his fifth interception of the season, and that was really easy for him. Yeah, and not a smart decision by trainer to just throw it up for grabs, try to get some yards, and get three points going into the, to the locker room. Not a smart decision. And that will be the end of the first half. 39 takeaways by Bethune-Cookman so far this season. Our halftime score, Bethune 27, Florida a m 14. Coming up, the State Farm Halftime Report and the Battle of the Bands after these messages. From the 31st edition of the Florida Classic, and we're at halftime where to score 27 to 14 Bethune Cookman University. You know, anytime you go to a HBCU game, one of the things that fans always look forward to is the halftime show and the Battle of the Bands. Well, they will not be disappointed today. But Bill Cookman is taking the field first. They're called the Marching Wildcats, also the Pride. And one of the things they talk about is uh, the one and only Bethune Cookman University Marching Wildcats are the epitome of pride, pride in themselves, pride in perfection, pride in performance, and pride in their expressions. Donovan Wells is the band director. Let's check out the Bethune Cookman University Marching Wildcats.
We'd like to thank the Bethune-Cookman University Marching Wildcats, the pride, for their performance at halftime. And we want to remind all our viewers to catch the final two episodes of the battle on ESPNU Thursday, where you can get an inside look at the HBCU marching band world of Bethune-Cookman and Florida a &M. The show goes further into the training, the discipline, heart and soul of the competition that are the classics. The battle presented by AT&T comes your way on ESPNU, the final two episodes starting Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. And coming up next, Florida A&M, the university's marching 100. This halftime report is presented by State Farm. Find an agent or get a quote at statefarm.com. Welcome back to the State Farm Halftime Report. On the field right now, the Florida A&M Marching 100 under the direction of Dr. Julian White. Let's go down and enjoy.
I'll wager it. Mr. Benjamin Sargent, if I say as many Williams, what would you say? The hundred, because I love you, Orlando.
Florida and m University Marching 100. We thank them for their halftime performance. We're at halftime here in Orlando, Florida. Coming up, highlights from the first half. A spectacular halftime show. Now it's time to get ready for the third quarter here in the 31st Florida Classic with J.C. Pearson. I'm Dave Lamagna. We've had almost two games in one here because the game began very well for the Rattlers, but the second quarter was all Bethune. Yeah, they came out. Florida A&M did very aggressive offensively, made some plays through the air, but then after that, it was all Bethune-Cookman. You can see the first play of the game right here, just the flea flicker, throw the ball down the field for Kevin Elliott, who makes a big play on it that led to the first touchdown. And a second touchdown with T.J. Lawrence. You think he's going to get belted, but he spins out of it. And at that point, Florida A&M had a 14-6 advantage. But then Bethune-Cookman comes right back through the air themselves. A big play down the field to Javon Reams that sets up the touchdown. And a simple one for Jonathan Moman, who goes in there standing up. And Bethune took complete command of this game in the second quarter. A lot of the 313 yards you see Bethune with right now is a vast majority of that was done in that second quarter while FAMU has slowed down considerably. They have not been able to get a run game going at all. And Bethune's the more heavily penalized team during the season, but it's FAMU that's drawn the wrath of the officials. Second half coming up. Thank you. This halftime report is presented by State Farm. Find an agent or get a quote at statefarm.com. Sorry, I'm late, fellas. As we get ready to start the third quarter, the second half here, 27 to 14, Bethune Cookman with a 13 point lead. Today's contest presented by McDonald's. I'm loving it. Now let's go back upstairs to Dave and JC. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. And we were loving the first half, and we'll see if we get that same kind of fireworks, except for FAMU. They've got to find a way to defeat this Bethune defense because the last four possessions for the Rattlers, they went punt, 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 interception that ended the half, 16 plays, 39 yards, not even three yards of play, if you can do the math. So can they get back to what they did well in the first quarter? And we'll start the third quarter in a moment. A little breezy on the field. Otherwise, really nice day here. No threat of rain. And temperature's probably now in the mid-70s. T.J. Lawrence, the redshirt sophomore from Lakeland, will take this kickoff. And has a little room here. Lawrence got some good blocking and gets it out to the 37, maybe the 36-yard line. We'll see where they finally make the spot. Let's go back, partner, and revisit the keys to the game and uh, see how you did. Well, for FAMU, you know, offensively, we talked about getting trainer on track early and in a flow, and they did do that. The problem is they haven't been able to run the ball, but he started out hot, and since then, it's kind of cooled off only 50 yards, and then defensively, they want to make Johnson one-dimensional, only 39 yards rushing for Johnson, but they brought in Jackie Wilson to do the running, and he's hurt him on the ground. And Trainer will come out firing wide away, a catch made of the 42-yard line. That'll be a gain of about six yards. Isaac West on the grab. Now, what about Brian Jenkins and the Wildcats? Well, for Bethune-Cookman offensively, they were going to come out and pound the ball. They have kind of changed up. They've got more passing yards in the first half than their season average, so they've thrown the ball well. And then they've done a great job defensively of taking Sylvester away. Only two yards rushing the entire first half. And yeah, they're going to try with Sylvester here. And no chance. No chance. They're going to lose a couple of more yards. Ryan Lewis, the number one tackler for this Wildcat defense, coordinated by Yogi Jones, able to cause a two-yard loss. But again, they continue to play close to the line of scrimmage and make sure that Sylvester doesn't get going in the run game. They bring Lewis off the edge. One of the linebackers, we've seen Sandilands, the other linebacker, quite a bit in the first half coming off the edge. And they just bring a lot of pressure up front. And that'll be a first down into Bethune territory. That's Lawrence on the catch. Or make that Adrian Smith number four, not six. That's Adrian Smith with a grab and a first down. But good throw here, just double slants, trying to clear out some room for him. 
and the slant opens up and it's a good throw by Austin Trainer again a quick throw doesn't let the pressure get to him and puts it right on the money to Adrian Smith and a hole finally opens up for Philip Sylvester have not been very many of those he's going to gain nine there Sylvester came in here averaging nearly six yards a carry. He doesn't even quite officially have 10 yards, and we have a late flag, too. Yeah, but watch on the outside. They just get the end pushed up the field, and now Sylvester's able to run through that crease right under him and get a gain, and that, that's his best run of the day so far. Dead ball. First and five. Offense. Number five. 15 yards. Second down. That's Kevin Elliott, the wide receiver, called for a personal foul. And we have seen a couple of these after the play moments that have led these MEAC officials to throw flags. Donnell Leathers is our referee. Eight penalties, 82 yards now for the Rattlers. And right after you said their best looking running play in a while. Right, in a long time, and it gets called back. And penalties has been a problem for them all year. Blitz trainer hangs in there and just overthrew his man. A little high on the pass, trying to get it to Max Purcell, the tight end. It's going to be third down at about 17. And here's a situation for Bethune Cookman where you don't want to bring a lot of pressure. It's third and 17. You want to play zone. Just have the ball thrown short in front of you so everybody can rally, make the tackle, and then for, force the punt on fourth down. And you see what Fabio has done today in third down, a little better than their season percentage. They've converted one in this drive already. Good job by the offensive line to handle the blitz, and Trainer hangs in there and gets the completion to T.J. Lawrence for a FAMU first down, 21 yards. A good throw again by trainer, but the safety is late. You see the safety at the top of the screen number 30 Chris Perry right there just late on the ball and even misses the tackle there. If he is a plays the ball and reading the quarterback, that's an easy interception for him because he's sitting back in zone coverage, but he just misses the play. That was one of those plays where you hold your breath when you see the safety coming yeah, at the you think DB. he's going to get a big shot and yep. just whiffs. Trainer his pass deflected to the line of scrimmage. And it went nowhere. Sandalins putting some heat on there. Along with Cornelius Wheeler. Looked like Wheeler is the one who made contact. And, you know, for FAMU, the running game is not working right now. But you still got to get the ball to Sylvester. Throw the check down to him. Throw some screens. He only has four catches all year long. So they don't use him in the passing game. But they've got to get him the ball somehow. And a way to do it is just to uh, run, throw some easy check downs to him. They haven't targeted him today. He stays in the block. And the catch made around the 25-yard line. Another flag in. The referee threw this one. Well, Cornelius Wheeler spiked the ball the previous play. This time, apparently, he spiked the quarterback. <laughs> so it's going to be a first down for AM and a quick meeting in the coach's office. Four for 53 penalties now for Bethune Cookman University. That was the quietest I've seen Brian Jenkins all day. Yeah, but <laughs> with that little finger at the yeah. end. <laughs> That's a one more of those, yeah. pal, and you can yeah. take the bus to Daytona now. Trainer to the end zone and missed his man. Looked like he was going for Max Purcell, 81, the tight end. Mike Williams has had an interception already today in coverage there, but this looked like it should have been a touchdown. Yeah, they had Purcell's open just running the seven route from the inside to tight end, and he's open if you can throw the ball out in front of him. You can see he saw a defender flash underneath. That changed his throw, but you got to throw it over the top. Give your guy a chance out front to make the play.
Trainer darts it into coverage that time. Wow, that pass deflected by Sandilands. And while fam, you probably figured they had a great chance last play. If you're a Bethune fan, you had to think, why didn't our guys catch yeah. that? Threw it into triple coverage. There's a lot of black shirts around that one. And now they're just one dimensional. They're throwing the ball every down, holding a little bit too long, trying to force the ball. And look, if it's not tipped right there by Sandlins, it's intercepted because the safety's coming from the other side of the field. They saw it the whole way. Well, they've converted two long third downs already on this drive. Gonna try the end zone one more time, and if we were in Canada, that might have been dangerous, but we're not. So it's gonna be fourth down and ten. Kevin Elliott, the intended receiver. Now the issue becomes what we see, fam, you trot out Trevor Scott for a field goal, and here he comes, number 35. So the first time that we've seen the Rattlers try a field goal, Scott, 9 of 13 on the year, long is 47. This would be about 30. <laughs> The holder is the punter, Brandon Holdren. And so the drive is not wasted. The Rattlers get on the board for the first time since the first quarter. The third Cookman finished the second quarter with an offense that was rolling almost unstoppable. Will that same offense come back in the third? There's your score in time. FAMU completes a 12-play, 51-yard drive of the 30-yard field goal. Well, Saturday night football presented by Southwest Airlines continues tonight on ABC at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, with regional action. Most of the country will see Taylor Martinez and the 8th-ranked Nebraska Cornhuskers face number 19, Texas A&M. Others will see 25th-ranked Florida State take on Maryland or USC versus Oregon State. Go to ESPN.com and search maps to see where you can find your game. We welcome you to the Citrus Bowl in Orlando. A few minutes away from the theme parks of the town. This is the 31st Florida Classic. Bethune Cookman 10-0 on the year trying to wrap up the MEAC championship and nail down a berth in the FCS playoffs. They've just given up a field goal and are awaiting their first possession of this second half after a spectacular battle of the bands between these two schools. The 2010 Florida Classic brought to you by McDonald's. I'm Dave Lamont with J.C. Pearson. We're upstairs. And Charlie Neal is keeping an eye on things at field level as Courtney Keith is belted to the 20-yard line. So that's where Bethune will get their first possession. We have not seen the return of Jackie Wilson, the second-string quarterback to the field yet. He was running quite a bit of plays as a relief for Matt Johnson just to give Bethune's offense a different appearance. Wilson went off what we heard was an ankle injury, and we have not seen him come back into the game. And there he is right there. But he's still in uniform, so there's a chance. Right now, he's holding the different boards that mean something to the Bethune offense. And Johnson on the handoff to Jonathan Momo who gets across the 25 to the 26-yard line for a solid gain of six. Farrell on the stop for Florida A&M. There's an idea. Now, everybody do, does these differently. There's some coaches that now use the boards with pictures and diagrams. Yeah. I'm waiting for you to pop up. I've seen yeah, Reese right. Davis on there, and I've seen a couple of other ESPN folks. Do so we need a J.C. Pearson board? Yeah, I wonder what that would mean. I don't know. Probably means play great defense. Yeah. That's what that is. Third down and a yard coming up after a short game. You can see Bethune Cookman, they want to come out and establish the run. And that's really what they've been known for all year. But in the first half, they, they were a throwing team. Threw for over 200 yards in the first half. And now they want to come back the second half, it looks like, and really pound the run game. Three out of seven on third down. Fake the jet sweep, go straight ahead. They'll make it four out of eight on first down. Look at this. The third down conversion. And the officials have not blown the ball dead. AM has it. Demarius Folson stripped the football. And coming out of it is Greg Harvey. This is what they needed. Something to give them some momentum and something to feel good about it. A long run, but look at him rip the ball out of there, and that's out of there 
well before his knee hits the ground, but that's a great job ripping that ball out of there and causing that fumble. That is only the 10th turnover by Bethune this year. They are incredible in turnover margin, plus 29 coming into the game. But they give it up here and a great opportunity now for Austin Trainer in just his third start as the Rattlers quarterback. He's won his first two. And he's in position now to make Bethune pay. But they've got to they've got to get Sylvester going somehow in this game. They try a reverse instead with Lawrence. Will he throw the ball? And he hung on to it, could not find a receiver open. And when you look downfield, he was double covered. So the loss of four might have been the better choice as Ryan Lewis was in on the stop. And another penalty marker on the field. That was Daniel Rhodes called for the personal foul penalty. The penalties today, I mean, just just ridiculous. And, and we've seen Bethune Cookman averages 10.7 penalties and almost 100 yards in penalty yardage a game. You know, you just got to be smart. You can't give up those kind of yards in big games. Yeah, five penalties, 67 yards against Bethune now. This is Levante. This is Sylvester, I should say. And Sylvester showing his skills outside the 25 to the 24-yard line for a gain of a dozen. And, and they go into the pistol formation. And what that does is it, it puts Sylvester right behind the quarterback. And now he can take the handoff running downhill with some power and some quickness as opposed to going sideways first. You see, now he can just come downhill just like it's eye formation and hit the hole a lot faster. You know, and that's the key. They wanted to be more balanced. They were heavy run oriented. Today they've been really pass oriented. So they've got to get him going in the run game to balance it out. Can't clearly see who the injured Bethune player is. Now we got a good look number 30 Chris Perry the free safety out of Lake Butler in Florida. Just to remind everybody what is at stake here for Bethune is very very simple if they win this game they finish the regular season 11 and 0 they win the MEAC with a perfect record of eight wins. And for Florida A&M, they're hoping to be a spoiler and maybe even keep their outside FCS playoff hopes alive. We'll return to Orlando. Monday, Phillip Rivers and Kyle Orton lead their high-powered offenses in a critical division clash. ESPN Monday Night Football, Broncos Chargers at 8.30. Happy to report that Chris Perry walked off under his own power. He's getting the medical attention he needs, and perhaps we'll see the redshirt senior free safety back into the game. But his backup, Mike Williams, the way it's listed on the depth chart, is the first team all MEAC yeah. safety. So it's not like Bethune drops off there. And you're seeing the skill now of Philip Sylvester finding a few holes and it looks like he's got the first down picks up 11 so he does. And at one point we had him unofficially zero yards for nine carries Sylvester has picked it up Jamil Farmington on the stop for Bethune. And that, that's what they've got to do they've got to create that balance they've got to get him involved. I talked about throwing him the ball some if Bethune continues to stack the box but they've been able to find some seams the last couple times he's carried it. They just don't do it philosophically apparently he's only caught four passes. Maybe you don't need to worry about it when you can get blocking like that and get into the end zone for the touchdown. <laughs> uh, 
That is Sylvester's second touchdown run. That one from 13 yards out, and Florida AM makes Bethune pay for the turnover. And they've gone more to a power style of running, just running leads and right off tackle. Had a great block by Brandon Curry, that left tackle, and created another crease for Sylvester to run through. And the snap bobbled, but handled the Rattlers have moved to within three. Philip Sylvester now with nine rushing touchdowns on the year. This one from 13 yards out of the Florida Classic is on its way to becoming one. Three-point ball game here, 27-24 Bethune-Cookman by a field goal. Let's take a look at the road ahead presented by Lexus. You know, the FCS playoffs get underway next week, and all Bethune-Cookman has to do to return to the playoffs for the first time since 2002 has come out victorious in this particular game today. Albany State, who finished the season with a perfect 10-0 record while wrapping up its first SIEC title since 2006, got a first-round bye to the Division II playoffs. They'll host a winner of today's Wingate-Morehouse game next Saturday at noon in the SWAC championship game all set for December 11th in Birmingham, Alabama. Alabama State has wrapped up the Eastern Division with a win over Southern last Saturday. Their opponent will either be Texas Southern or Grambling. Charlie, thank you so much. That was a four-play, 46-yard drive in 75 seconds for the Rattlers. And in this quarter, they've had 16 plays, 97 yards, and 10 points. So the heat is on the Wildcats to settle down a little bit. We're even in the turnover battle. Something that Bethune has dominated all season long against their other opponents. This is Courtney Keith. And he is wrapped up and falls forward to the 30-yard line. So that's where Matt Johnson will take over. Bethune had a great play on the run by Bell. Got him a first down, but he fumbled the football, and FAMU took it in in four plays. So, but Bethune has faced adversity in this game already when they fell behind 14 to 6. Playing from behind is something they have rarely had to do in this undefeated season. Isidore Jackson flipped a defender over and getting open. 35-30. This is Eddie Poole. Probably one too many cutbacks yeah. there. JC's <laughs> looking around up here, not expecting Poole to make that extra cutback, but it's still a 45-yard game. Yeah, and, and a great pickup on the blitz. Watch the running back does a great job picking up the blitz by John Ojo. That gives Johnson time to find Poole. And now you just got to get up the field. Go straight down the field instead of going across the field. And he may have more yards, but good job right here on the cut. Now just get down the field. And stick a foot in the ground. Johnson's going to do that, and he's going to be slowed down and stepped out of bounds after a three-yard gain. And again, Johnson, particularly with Wilson, apparently not returning to the game. Going to be a little smart about his scrambles. Well, this is a, a game that's turning into a game of big punches. Not yeah. a lot of jabs now. Here's a screen. And it was well played by Kendrick Washington. Eddie Poole was the intended receiver. Washington came in and read the play and almost, it may have interrupted Poole's line of sight. Yeah, no question. I, I thought at one point he might have been able to jump up and, and intercept that ball, but it definitely forced a bad throw by Matt Johnson. Now Johnson's done well overall, though, J.C. One touchdown pass, 11 of 16 for 209 yards, and he's run for 42 on seven carries. Three out of eight third downs for the Wildcats. Johnson feels a little pressure from the backside, fumbles the ball. An opportunity here for the Wildcats and the Rattlers. This is Marquise Ramos down the sideline, and they finally get a toehold on him at the 24-yard line. The guard, Brandon Gould, on the tackle.
All season long, Bethune has beaten opponents by making fewer mistakes. They're now minus one in the turnover battle. And watch Matt Johnson run right back into the pressure. Doesn't see the backside pressure. Runs right back into it. The fumble. Now Ramos picks the ball up and almost turns it into six. Trying to get down the field and just gets tripped up. But watch right here. Just the backside. And I think that was Kendrick Washington again coming in from the backside. Matt Johnson never saw him. That is the fifth fumble by Bethune today. They have lost the last two. Now back to the ground. And Sylvester running with power, and he's out of bounds inside the 15 to about the 14 yard line. Winning margin. I can hardly think of another team in the country that's even close to Bethune, but today, a different deal. Second down and maybe a yard to go, maybe even a little bit less. And suddenly, FAMU was getting Sylvester warmed up. Yeah, and just a power running game. You see the I formation again right here. Two tight ends, I formation, just come downhill. Downhill was plugged up. So no gain on the play. Here comes a critical third down and about a yard. Jamil Farmington, a junior out of Miami, was able to plug the hole that time. Yeah, but what it does, though, it sets up the play action, sets up the bootleg. Everything stems off the running game. And if you make... Bethune Cookman have to stack the box bring eight nine guys in the box because Sylvester's starting to get going in the run now it should open up things in the passing game third and one and trainer will keep it he'll have it inside the 10 the Rattlers now six of 12 on third downs they've converted three out of four in this half now they use sylvester as a lead blocker watch number 30 he's just the lead blocker now just trying to clear enough room for trainer to get a first down and just another way to to get positive yards in the run game jarkevitz fields made the stop and now inside the red zone where the two have been fairly stingy this year Inside the five to the four. And the emotions in the crowd swinging back and forth between the two sides. You got Bethune on one side, on the far sideline, on the near sideline is the FAMU rooting section. And of course, at any moment, either band could chime in when the time is right. That's why this game is close. Bethune Cookman had a 27 14 halftime lead. That's Lawrence. He won't make it in the end zone. A sure tackle that time by Mike Williams. First team all MEAC safety. Good close by Williams. It looked like Lawrence was going to get in right here, but good job getting his head across the body. Driving his legs and then pushing the receiver backwards. Uh, you got to wonder here, partner. Is this two down? Do you take two shots at it if you don't get in here? Think you got to go eye formation. You go power. That's what you've done best. And in this situation, watch for Sylvester being the lead blocker again. There he goes. Trainer, a little jump pass deflected and picked. And I think the smart move, and that is Williams with his second interception. Unbelievable. And now it's the other side where the emotion goes to the Bethune wow. fans. Wow, he just doesn't get enough on that ball. This nope. is a the Florida Gator play. Tim Tebow used to run it a lot. It looks like it's open right here, but now you got to throw the ball. You got hit at the end. It just... He wasn't open at all anyway. Now he's trying to get it to Purcell. Yeah, and you can see he takes a shot in the ball. He was just never open. He's got to throw that ball. Yeah, though. throw you know it to I the mean? back of the end zone. And <laughs> if your guy doesn't get it, it's incomplete. You could throw that over to that uh, section of fans behind me. Throw it over to where Charlie is. Charlie will catch it. 
but don't don't just lob it in there. So it's back to an even turnover margin, and this game is really getting interesting. Yeah, that was big though because <laughs> they they took they could have gotten three at least if they don't turn the ball over there. Well, Bethune has put the ball on the ground five times today. Not there. Isidore Jackson hangs on. Very little gain. And Austin Trainer getting a few instructions. His wristband there. You got to wonder if Matt Johnson got hurt on that last play where he fumbled, rolled to the backside, and got hit on the backside by Kendrick Washington because he's not in the game. That looks to be Troy Danahauer, number 10. And he'll keep it, and he takes a direct hit. No gain for Danahauer. Willie Farrell, who's played a monstrous game today for the Rattlers, Alfonso Walker also. There you see what Troy has done this year for Bethune, so he's had an opportunity to play some. He is a freshman out of Daytona Beach. That's the home of the Wildcats. Yeah, but he's the third guy. Remember, Jackie yes. Wilson went down. And he was the number two guy, so now they're they're down to their third quarterback. And you got to wonder, you see those numbers are nice, but when did he play? Did he play in garbage time? Did he play against an overmatched opponent? Certainly not in a situation like this, but he's going to take his first throw, slings it out incomplete. Fourth and ten coming up. So just when it seems that things were settled for Bethune, they may not be. Tried to get it to Javon Reams and just missed. What a tough spot for Danahauer to come in. Johnson either pulled or is injured. Yeah, and I can't think that he, they would have pulled him. I yeah. think he may have gotten an injury because he got hit from the blind side in that last series when he fumbled. And Kowalski with the puck. This is Lawrence. Oh, he got a block. Lawrence to the 35. Has some room down the sideline. To the five. Touchdown! <laughs> and we see a flag. The officials are canvassing at the six-yard line. That reaction by Lawrence may tell you everything you need to know about what we are about to hear from our referee, Donnell Leathers. There were multiple fouls on the play. Illegal substitution on the offense, on the defense. Number four, we also have a hole doing a run back. They offset. We played it down. Well, wait, 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 wait. He pointed the same direction twice. Yeah, they've got to get this straightened out. Yeah, that, that didn't come out the way yeah. he intended. A couple big blocks here right, right there. That's a clean block right there. They called the hole somewhere down that we missed, but had some good blocks. There was an illegal substitution call as well. All right, let's take a look at the illegal substitution. You see the guy coming off the field all right for fam you down there well then the penalty cannot offset no they're both on fam you right so he was correct in the direction he pointed but when he said the offset that doesn't jive they're getting it corrected Adrian Smith was the player called for the penalty you know, if I'm Brian Jenkins, I am trying well, to remind the official. Um, and the illegal substitution doesn't give them enough for a first down. So they'll end up, if they take that penalty. The foul against the defense. The illegal substitution, number four, is declined. We have holding, doing a return, 10 yards from the spot of the foul. First down. Okay, there you go. Now we got it. Well, Florida A&M has really hurt themselves with penalties. And in a close game like this, and if, by the way, we need to remind everybody, particularly those who are just tuning in, that Bethune is missing some points they ought to have 
because they've missed two extra points. They've hit a two-point conversion, so they're missing at least one point. And so it shouldn't be a three-point game if all were normal, but this is the Florida Classic, and often the normal does not happen. So the football, the officials are huddling again right at midfield. Boy, this is just, ins it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> By the way, speaking of insanity and going right down to the wire, we got the final race of the season. The championship will be decided in South Florida. Winner take all, Denny Hamlin, Jimmy Johnson, Kevin Harvick with an NASCAR Sprint Cup championship, including with a Ford 400 at Homestead, Miami, tomorrow at 1 Eastern on ESPN. Coverage will begin with NASCAR countdown at noon Eastern on ESPN2, that beautiful track. If you're driving down to the Florida Keys, you might see that off on the east side of town in Homestead. Jimmy Johnson, four straight Sprint Cup championships, already unprecedented, going for number five. He's just 15 points behind. Casey Kane has pole, however. All right, the officials have decided the best thing to do is put the football at the 50-yard line above the R in Florida Classic. And for some reason, they think it's should be their ball no and i don't know what, no. where that's coming from no sorry coach hate to disagree but legal substitution doesn't override the hold <laughs> so we got the well they declined that one that wasn't yeah. that wasn't going to give them a first down anyway right they didn't want to re-kick it and so here we go things i think have settled here we go here we go with Austin Trainer. What's going to happen next? Sylvester, that's what you call planting your foot in the ground. If he cuts back the other way, he could go. Sylvester being chased from behind. He will get in. They're going to mark him. Oh, my gosh. I thought he got in. They're going to mark him out at the one. He hit the pylon, J.C. Wow. He hit the pylon. <laughs> <laughs> just the inside zone read. It just gets north and south and then just makes a couple cuts. You see missed tackles. But right here, this cut, the pursuit angles of everybody overran him. And now it's a foot race to the end zone. And wow, that's tough. Well, there, and watch this angle right here. See, all he's got to do is just get over the end zone. It's tough to see right there, but it looks like he got in. They called him down at the one. Well, you see the difference in this game. It's one of the reasons the Rattlers are right breathing down the necks of BCU. Is the 105 rushing yards for Sylvester. Bethune has taken a timeout. By the way, I know what some of you back home are thinking. Why do they just go to the replay official? Yeah. Well, we don't we don't do that in the MIAC. It's not done. It's not part of the rules. So that's why we're not going to get this play reviewed and potentially overturned. The pylon, by the way, is down. Hey, you know what? The official was correct. That's a great look. Thank you guys from the yeah. truck and our crew. His, his right foot slides yep. out, but from that angle, you don't see if the ball crossed the no. plane of the goal yeah. line. You're first. right. You're right. The official saw the foot without the pylon in place. Right. He all can't all judge the ball it. has to do is break the plane of the goal line, but it doesn't matter. They made the call. They shorted the goal line. It's first and goal right here. They want to get it in. They've got to punch it in. And trainer from a yard and a half out got it about a half a yard closer. So it's going to be second down and goal from the one. I'm going to bet they don't call the jump pass. Yeah, and, but it's not so easy to get it in from down here. We, we saw that last drive where they had the interception, but, you know, the, you got to just continue to pound the ball. Sylvester's done a great job of running this half. Over 100 yards now and coming in. He only had two yards at halftime. Yeah, I go to the now. money back here if I'm fam you. I got to go to Sylvester. They bring in some extra blockers. Levante Page, you see 32. 
They brought in an extra big guard in Franklin Carter, 78, in the backfield in the refrigerator parry position. And the officials put up three fingers instead of two arms. Did not make it. Not in. Let's take a look. Now Bethune-Cookman defensively, they're doing a great job of penetrating and being stout. Look at all the black jerseys on the other side of the line of scrimmage, and now they do a good job of pulling backwards. See, they don't push him because if they push, they push him into the end zone. They're doing a great job of pulling him back away from the end zone. Third down and less than a yard to go. Do they go to Sylvester here? It's Levante Page in the tailback spot. And into the end zone, the Rattlers have retaken the lead. So the sixth touchdown of the season for Page, who came in for Sylvester, who might have needed a little bit of a break after that crazed run. And the Rattlers have dominated this third quarter with some help from Bethune's erratic play. And somebody's put Brian Jenkins' headset back together. <laughs> what happened in the first half? If it keeps going the way it's going, he's going to break it again. Well, the difference now, four. All right, a couple of things we need to remind you of. First off, the offense in this half. We mentioned the Rattlers, 214. Remember, they only came into the game averaging 278 total. Yeah. So total yards now, we have them at 363. But they've done a great job this half of getting Sylvester involved. The running game, the first half was all passing. And now they made a conscious effort coming out of the locker room at halftime to get Sylvester going in the run game and done a great job. Now, this is a, an intense rivalry under any circumstances, but this is what's at stake for Bethune-Cookman. Should they win this game, the MEAC title goes on the bus. It goes back to Daytona Beach, and they're in the FCS playoffs, and they may be a very high seed as well because they'll finish 11-0. However, if they do not win, then we have the potential for a three-way tie between Florida A&M, Bethune-Cookman, and that always very strong South Carolina State team. But Charlie Neal mentioned earlier tonight that it looks like no matter what, Bethune should get in. But it may introduce FAMU or SC State as a possible second bid into the FCS playoffs as an at-large team. Additionally, we've got some drama on the Bethune-Cookman sidelines regarding their quarterback situation. We'll update you that following the kickoff. And a line drive kick that'll slow things down a little bit. Preston Cleckley at the 25, and he hesitated, and man, did he pay for that hesitation. He got to the 27-yard line and just got smacked. The hit there by Devon Roberts. All right, let's take a look at what's been going on in the MIAC. Well, we've been here. Delaware State with the win. Norfolk State beats Savannah State. And there's South Carolina State doing what was expected, demolishing North Carolina A&T. So here's now what the MIAC looks like. South Carolina State moves to 7-1 and, and just sort of hanging out. Probably sitting around the TVs rooting for the Rattlers. Now, the other thing with Bethune is that Troy Danahauer is still the quarterback. No, that's not Danahauer anymore. They throw deep down the field. That's Jackie Wilson who's back into the game after we had just been told during the break that he was not returning. He's back. He left with an ankle injury. Matt Johnson, the starting quarterback, the number one quarterback, we do know has gone to the locker room for treatment for an undisclosed injury. Yeah, but the issue here is, can Jackie Wilson run? And that's what he's, he does best. And that again, we were, ankle. we were told by the Bethune folks that Wilson was not going to return. Second and 10, Wilson, good runner, but is he gonna be able to do this? Coming off of an ankle, he just sort of lured his shoulder with the 31-yard line and picked up four before being brought down there. Yeah, got a little limp to him, but uh, looked like he was moving okay when he ran, but you can see the, 
definitely favoring that ankle right there. Is the toughest thing, JC, with an ankle straight ahead or lateral movement? Well, laterally. It, it's hard to cut and plant and, and explode off of it, but you know, it looks like they're going to need him for his arm more so than his legs right now. Three out of ten on third downs. Quick throw. Right at the marker. Contact made a hard hit by Hall. But looks like it should be a first down. Catch made by Eddie Poole. And it is a first down. Down to a minute and 28 in the third quarter. It's been dominated by Florida A&M. They've scored 17 points. Bethune, zero in this quarter. And great little run in traffic that time by Isidore Jackson. He picked up an additional couple of yards. Got five out to the 44, maybe even six out to the 44-yard line. Can't even imagine what the fourth quarter is going to be like. Yeah. Because this, this game <laughs> has just been nuts. The even-numbered quarter belonging to Bethune. The odd-numbered quarter belonging to the Rattlers. And this running play, only a yard. So it's going to be third down and three. We're under 40 seconds in our third quarter. Ramos, who had that long fumble recovery that set up the last Florida A&M touchdown. On the stop. Here's a big third down and three. And this is where you think Wilson would just take off because he's a really good runner, but yeah. you wonder about his ankle. About his ankle and did a great job in the first half of running that zone read and keeping that ball inside, and that's where he was very effective. Bump fakes. He's going to try to find the hole. He's going to be hit and going to be brought down short. He was slowed down by Joshua Newkirk, 56, and then put down by Demarius Folson, and that is the final play of the third quarter. Great suspense coming into the fourth, but through Cookman's undefeated season, hanging in the balance, they trail Florida A&M in what really is a Florida classic. MLS Cup 2010, tomorrow, 8.30 on ESPN. You know what 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 and here is tonight's game summary brought to you by State Farm. We mentioned the domination of the even numbered quarter by Bethune, the odd numbered quarters by Florida AM. Sylvester has gotten going in the third quarter with a huge quarter. Bethune, even in the turnover battle, a couple of their turnovers have been converted to points by the Rattlers. And again, for Bethune, they wrap up the MIAC. Maybe, JC, this is why yeah. this game full is full. like this, man. Strange things happen, supposedly, when there's a full moon, huh? Now, Bethune is going to punt Corey Kowalski on the field. It's also mentioned that Bethune's starting quarterback, Matt Johnson, out of the game with an undisclosed injury. We do not know if he'll return. Kowalski puts a lot of spin on this one, but it's caught directly at the 24 and falling forward to the, for virtually no gain. So Florida A&M will take the ball over. I'm Dave Lamont, J.C. Pearson. We are upstairs, and our friend Charlie Neal keeping an eye on things on the field. We thank you very much for joining us here at the Florida Classic in downtown Orlando. Great crowd on hand, a lot at stake. We had the battle of the bands at halftime, and now it belongs to the players on the field. What a spot for the redshirt freshman quarterback. Austin Trainer, just his third start. He won his first two. Better throw over the football, the coaches told us. That's why they sat down Martin Ukpai. And he did a good job in yep. the first half, at least the first quarter. And now them being able to run the ball really takes a lot of pressure off of him. And they are going to try to pound it. And you see Sylvester. He gets pushed out of bounds at around the 28-29 yard line. Run out by Ozzie Slater. Well, Sylvester going to need a huge quarter, but he's over 900 yards for the year. He needed 148 for 3,000 in his career, so he is getting closer to that. To get to 1,000 yards for the season, he's going to have to go wild in this quarter, but he certainly seems capable of it. He's had five, you know, the last five games, he's had over 100 yards rushing. 
had that 192 yard game versus Morgan but you know he's missed three games because of, of health he's been injured for three games and now that he's healthy they're getting him the ball he's running well and this is trainer with a little option opportunity he'll get it out to the 38 yard line that's a significant game mike williams on the stop it's a rattler's first down a gain of 10 and for the, austin trainer and something that you don't expect for him to do is keep the ball and run on the zone read everybody's thinking sylvester and look look how wide open it is outside for trainer just gets down the field and a big first down i gotta think that the, the goal here is keep away yeah, I mean, and run the clock. Yeah. Keep the clock moving, put some first downs together. Sandalin on the run blitz, and he almost got him in the backfield. Sylvester will get fight to the 40 yard line. Look how Sylvester is built. He's not tall at 5'10. He's 185 pounds. They list him here. And it seems like 160 of that is below his stomach. <laughs> Those are some, that's just, the trunk on that guy is enormous. Strong, powerful legs. Low to the ground, and that's why he's so hard to tackle. And he's quick, he's fast. Change of direction is good, and runs through those arm tackles. Taking a little extra air here on second down and eight, but you get the feeling they're going to ride Sylvester as much far as they can in this fourth quarter. He'll stay in the block this time. Trainer, nice pass. That'll be right around the marker. It looks like it's going to be right on top of it to the tight end Max Purcell. So you're going to be third and really short or a first down. They move the chain. Yeah, good throw by trainer. Good read. He sees the blitz coming, knows he's got to get the ball out of his hands. Sylvester comes across and just chips on the blitzer and gives him enough time to find Purcell for the first down. Trainer 17 of 34 for 250. He's been picked twice. He has one touchdown pass. And across and taking a hard shot was Eddie Rocker, who comes right back with a few words for Mike Williams. And there's a flag down. And that was thrown in the way back in the defensive backfield. And we also have a Bethune player who just fell to the ground, and that's Williams. Not 100% sure what happened. Here's the penalty. Personal five. Offense. Number five. Low to the head. 15 yards. Second down. All right, that's Kevin Elliott hit with a personal foul. We've had a ton of these. I can think of at least a half a dozen, maybe seven or eight even personal foul penalties. Yeah, and I think that's the second one on him today. Yeah, it is. Ten penalties, 108 yards against the Rattlers. And every time they take a step forward, they take at least a half a step back when they make a mistake like that. Elliott pleading his case, but haven't seen one of those things overturned yet. And we're hoping that Mike Williams will be okay. They lost the guy in front of him on the depth chart, Chris Perry, to an injury earlier. And we will take an opportunity to step aside with the Rattlers in charge of the Florida Classic in Orlando. ESPN's College Football is presented by McDonald's. I'm loving it. 31 27 to score here. Florida AM on top of a film Cookman and Amiak announced his postseason awards and the coach of the year honors. No surprise as Bethune Cookman's Brian Jenkins, the unanimous choice. Jenkins in his first year at Daytona Beach has led the Wildcats to an unbeaten record and a number seven ranking. In the FCS polls, the offensive player of the year honor went to Bethune Cookman quarterback Matt Johnson, who leads, leads the conference in total offense. He is out of the game right now. Understand he probably will not return with a fractured scapula. That's a bone under his uh, armpit. He was named the offensive player of the week five times during the regular season. The defensive player of the year is South Carolina State linebacker David Irby, who led his team in tackles with and also had two interceptions. And the rookie of the week, or rookie of the year, I should say, is Hampton running back Antoine Chisholm, who was a three-time rookie of the week. And the offensive lineman of the year, Josh Harrison of South Carolina State, helped pave the way for the Bulldogs to amass over 3,600 offensive yards. Gentlemen. All right, Charlie, thank you so much.
Mike Williams able to jog off the field after some help, so hopefully we'll get a chance to see him again. Second and long after the penalty, and this is Rocker getting some fresh legs in there. Sylvester has worked really hard. He gets out to the 46. That's a gain of six, so it's going to be third down and quite a ways to go yet. It doesn't. Ryan Lewis in on the stop for Bethune. How about that news on Matt Johnson? You know, we yeah. talked all day about, you know, maybe that's why they had had uh, Jackie Wilson in there running the ball to try to take care of Matt Johnson in case of injuries because he's their guy and, and now all of a sudden with that injury you know it's going to be tough to come back and play that's for sure trainer all kind of time but threw a little behind the receiver so it'll be fourth down in a dozen and the will get the ball back here. Kevin Elliott was the intended receiver. Ozzy Slater in coverage. Brandon Holdren, all MIAC punter, in the game now. Courtney Keith. Again, the number one punter in the MIAC, kicking to the number one punt return man in the MIAC. The Thune barely got enough people on. This is a beauty, really high. Keith drifts to the seven and smartly calls for the fair catch because he had three Rattlers right on top of him. Well, this week on ESPN's Monday Night Football, it's a battle of AFC West rivals. Kyle Orton leaves the Denver Broncos into San Diego to face Phillip Rivers and the Chargers. Broncos Chargers on ESPN's Monday Night Football at 8.30 Eastern. Coverage will start at 7 o'clock Eastern with Monday Night Countdown served by Applebee's. 11.33 to go here and still plenty of time for whoever the quarterback is going to be for Bethune. It looks like it's going to be Wilson. They brought in their third-string quarterback, Troy Danahauer, for one series, and it didn't go especially well. They also have Maurice Francois, who's primarily a wide receiver, but used to play quarterback. This is Isidore Jackson on the carry. And, you know, it's funny, J.C., FAMU couldn't run the ball well in the first half. Now it doesn't seem like Bethune's running the ball all that well in the second half. Yeah. yeah. And Philip Sylvester is not single-handedly, of course. He's got a lot of help, but... Is out game Bethune. Bethune's also turned it over a couple of times in this half. They'll stay on the ground again. And nothing doing that time. Willie Farrell has just been a giant for this Tim Edwards Earl Holmes defense. Sophomore from Tallahassee. He has been terrific. And what they are doing right now is not respecting the arm of Jackie Wilson so now they're stacking the box they're bringing guys on the snap for the run game and trying to make Wilson beat him with their with the pass and now you see it looks like they're manned up and might be bringing some pressure back to safety out of there and they just rushed four. Wilson in trouble and he's brought down that's a sack by FAMU Jerry Willis his second sack of the night the junior from Chicago and it's a three and out for the undefeated Wildcats. Yeah, and they only rush four guys, but they get a lot of penetration up the field. They flush Wilson to his left and right back into the arms of Jerry Willis. That was a great defensive drive, defensive series by FAMU. Boy, that was Willis going right after that Teal Curry, the first team all MEAC center, and he just beat him. Low kick. Let's see what happens on the return. And wow, that's an interesting decision by Lawrence. And he ends up stepping out of bounds at the 46 yard line. So for Florida AM, they are nine minutes and 47 seconds away from stealing the Florida Classic from an undefeated Bethune Cookman Wildcats. Let's take a look at some of the action from halftime brought to you by McDonald's. That was today's McDonald's bringing the flavor. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. We appreciate your perspective from down on the field today. Florida AM leading Bethune Cookman, and they have the ball at their own 46 yard line. And Thursday night, 
You can catch the final two episodes of the battle on ESPNU. You get an inside look at the HBCU marching band world of Bethune-Cookman and Florida A&M. The show goes further into the training, discipline, heart, and soul of the competition that are the classics. The battle presented by AT&T on ESPNU. The final two episodes starting Thursday at 7 Eastern. Sylvester back in a tailback for the Rattlers. He's over 100 yards for the sixth straight game. And he won't get anything here. In fact, you can take a couple off of his total. It'll be second down and 12. Ryan Davis, the defensive end from out of Tampa, in there on the stop for the Wildcats, who need this ball back quickly. And trainer seems very comfortable with those sideline patterns. He gets it to Isaac West, who got into Bethune territory, the 48-yard line, before Ozzy Slater dumped him. That's a gain of eight and sets up a critical third down and four. And FAMU has been very successful, 7 of 15 in third down conversions today. That's way better than what Bethune normally allows, which is just 28%. Yeah, and they've been doing a good job of just giving trainers some easy throws, quick throws, slants, stops. And now with the running game going also, they've been able to convert some third downs with the run game. And they've done it again, or did they? Oh, just a second. Look at this spot on the official at the 45-yard line. And they may have an injury to Kevin Elliott, too, that may have caused him to fall what appears to be short of the first down. Yeah, may have cramped up, but he had enough yardage, and then he ran backwards and then slip down you got to know where those chains are because the most important thing is to get the first down all he really had to do was fall forward once he first caught the football see right there he's got enough just go forward he tries to avoid taking the tackle and then he slips down and now he's short and instead of extending that drive being able to use some more clock now they've got to punt the ball away. File that one away, everybody, in your memory banks. And I don't know if I'm fam you. I may go for this. It's fourth and short right here. Yeah, they're going to punt. And they get it off quickly. And if this goes, oh, we've got a nice kick, though. It's going to be down and around the 14-yard line. So they managed. Brandon Holdren got a punt inside the 20-yard line. But a big break for Bethune on the mistake made by the receiver. Bethune gets the ball back, 7.45 remaining. When you join together talented student athletes with great coaches at wonderful institutions of higher learning, you have all the resources you need to achieve success. The Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference was established on the principles of educating and preparing student athletes for the game of life. Comprised of 13 outstanding institutions, the MEAC continues its tradition of athletic dominance on the playing field and academic success in the classroom. The Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, celebrating excellence. Don't waste your money. Your computer could be infected with spyware, malware, viruses, or you could be experiencing registry errors, spam, and pop-ups. With new technology, you no longer need a technician to come to your home or drop your computer at some store. Get a free diagnosis at MaxMySpeed.com and find out in minutes what's slowing down your computer. They were able to diagnose it and solve our problem. Here's your score in time here, the 2010 Florida Classic in downtown Orlando. Bethune Cookman trying to preserve an undefeated season. Saturday Night Football presented by Southwest Airlines continues tonight on ABC at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific with regional action. Most of the country will see Taylor Martinez and the number 8 Nebraska Cornhuskers face number 19 Texas A&M. Others will see 25th ranked Florida State take on Maryland or USC against Oregon State. Go to ESPN.com and search maps to see where you can find your game. So a second string quarterback how about the attendance today over 61,000 yeah, that's one of the it continues to be a well attended game here in Orlando this Florida Classic and missing on the pass is Jackie Wilson replacing the injured Matt Johnson Charlie Neal reported that Johnson suffered a fractured scapula that's a bone below the armpit 
Maurice Francois was the intended receiver. Wilson came into the game having only completed 7 of 14 passes for 88 yards. He is more of the running style quarterback, but he may be asked to pitch it around now to get Bethune in front. Well, the day he's 3 of 4 for 51. That's what he does best, and that's a nifty move in traffic. And he will get a first down. That's a gain of a dozen yards. Queer Hall finally bringing him in, but... And Wilson left this game with a bit of an ankle injury, but he seems to be okay right now. Yeah, he gets up limping, but it, when he runs, there's no limp to his run. Good cut right there, another cut. Gets down the field enough for a first down. When he gets up again, that, that ankle bothers him big time. Pressure from the backside. He's got to get out of there, and he is brought down by Kendrick Washington. He has been, at times, unblockable. Number 97 in the orange and green. He's been all over, but you got to give credit to the secondary, too. Nowhere... For Wilson to throw the ball and he's got to hold it hold it hold it that allows time for that rush to get to him Ryan Jenkins his first year at Bethune Cookman it was an assistant with Greg Schiano last season this is only the only they haven't had to make fourth quarter comebacks this year they did it against Hampton taking the deep shot down the field Ooh, nobody has it Trying to get it to Eddie Poole into double coverage. Hall was in there. And John Ojo came over from his safety position. Yeah, just double coverage. Ojo, the safety 25, just sees it all the way. And, and Hall, number one in man coverage, just nowhere for that ball to get fit in there. They've got him short, and they've got him over the top. And Poole looked like he might have been a touch shaken up. Here's third and eight. That's the sixth fumble of the day, and once again, Washington is there with a tackle. Second time that Wilson has had a problem with that snap today. Didn't look like a bad snap. Wasn't perfect, but it wasn't that bad. Yeah, we've seen that a number of times today. They're all just low and to the left. And Washington just using that speed rush, just running right by the tackle, Alex Monroe. And Washington has been an assassin back there. That's a pretty good kick from Kowalski, but this is going to be good field position for the Rattlers. And that's going to be a flag because fair catch. And they're going to make sure that the officials, if there was a signal, communicate, which is the right thing to do, and decide whether or not they should throw a flag. And there is no penalty. I didn't see a fair catch signal. The officials say, wait, we're playing football, fellas. It's a FAMU ball at the 47-yard line. Let's see if we can see a signal here. Nope, no signal. His knee was down. But his knee is down. Yep. And then there, that's the right call to make no call right there because the defender coming down the field, number 31, really tried to get out of the way. That's Tavares Bell really tried to get out of the way and jump over him. Just some incidental contact there. Sylvester, very patient runner, waited for something to develop, picked up a couple that time. Under six minutes remaining, Bethune-Cookman came in here, number seven in the FCS poll, number one in the Sheridan HBCU poll. But Florida A&M has taken advantage of Bethune's mistakes, and they have shut them out in this half. Sylvester, nice hole there. He has a first down and a lot more out to the 40-yard line for Sylvester. That's a gain of 11 and a clock-stopping first down with 5.15 to go, but it won't say stop for long. Yeah, and they did a great job, or they've done a great job out of this pistol formation 
today where now Sylvester can run downhill with power and does a great job. The left tackle, Brandon Curry, just kicks out, and he's able to just get down the field. And that plays work to perfection in this entire second half, especially when they get in that pistol. He's able to come downhill with power. And just staying on the ground. And that's Rocker. He's got fresher legs, and he'll get almost eight yards. And they really look like they're starting to wear this Bethune-Cookman yep. defense down. A lot of missed tackles now. They don't seem to be as aggressive as they were in the first half. And that's because when you continue to pound the run game and you're physical with it, it takes its toll on the defense. Should FAMU hang on here, we would end up with a three-way tie atop the MEAC with South Carolina State, Florida A&M, and Bethune. And I know they've got a young quarterback here, but they should really work the clock now. Don't snap the ball until there's two seconds left on the play clock. That time they snapped it at five. Rocker gets the first down, the 25. You can start to see the Wildcat defenders trying to yank the ball yeah. out, but they're missing tackles while they're doing yep. that. And finally, Eugene Solomon was able to stop the runner, but it's another first down. And the clock continues to run, and you got to be smart about it. Use every second you can use off of that play clock before you snap the ball. 1975, Bethune came in 9 0 into this game, and FAMU beat them. You can see right now taking their time, doing a good job trying to use the clock, but still have more clock to use. They're also not running anywhere close to out of bounds. Bethune with two timeouts. And again, let's remind you what's at stake for Bethune a perfect season in the regular season. If they drop to 7-1, and one, they'll go to 10-1 and one overall. South Carolina State took care of business today. Florida A&M in front. The clock now at 3.20 and counting. Yeah, one of the things you've got to really watch out for here for Florida A&M, it'll be a moral victory because South Carolina State already won today. And even if FAMU wins this, Bethune would represent the conference based on the point system. But I'm sure FAMU will take it. <laughs> it might be a moral victory, but it's a victory over Bethune, their rival, and gets them a share of the championship. And Sylvester looking for a share of the end zone. This knocked out of bounds inside the 10 at the 6-yard line by Chris Perry, who's back in the game. But you get a sense here that Florida A&M is on their way to the end zone. Yeah. They, they just look like the fresher team right now. They've really worn this defense down. It's just a power run game. Same thing, just the lead. Missed tackles. First down. And Sylvester has just been a powerhouse. 138 yards in this game now and a couple of TDs. Oh, a trainer almost committing a disaster. And we have a false start penalty. It's going to supersede that play. And maybe one time Fammy was happy to have a flag on him. So that'll back it up to the 11-yard yeah. yeah. line. But but in reality, yes, they lose five yards, but the clock winds and it's first down again. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it from FAMU standpoint, they they lost five yards, but they gain it. They get to run that down again, and the clock continues to move. Right. They're hiking it too soon. They got to continue to run that clock. They hiked it with eight on the play clock. Rocker is tackled in the backfield, and it's going to be a loss of three back to the 14. And then it's Perry again. Yeah, and in a game like this, every second counts because it's so close. You got to be smart right here. That's what they should be talking to trainer about is watch that play clock and don't snap the ball until there's two or one second left. He's snapping it, you know, the last three times he snapped it with eight seconds left. You know, that's 24, five seconds on the clock. What about Bethune using timeouts here, JC? Well, it's second and goal. You know, if they get a stop here, they'll probably start to use them. If they have to. Trainer gonna put it up. Goes into the back of the end zone, and he threw it away once he realized, but well, now, is, is there a flag down also? It appears to be at the 12-yard line. 
We'll make sure of that. Might but, be a towel. But why throw the ball? I agree with you completely. Why throw the ball? I'm with the you. The clock is on your side. You want the clock to keep running. That is a flag. We thought it might have been a flag or a towel, but let's see what this one's all about. Bethune is applauding what the uh, upcoming call. Here's an interesting decision. You back him, you keep backing them up and making a field goal more difficult if you're even thinking about that. Or do you just say, okay, you know what, we'll take third down here. And that's what that feel on the offense, number 88. That penalty decline. Third down. That's Michael Etheridge, who's a reserve tight end. But again, and, and what you do there is you save Bethune a timeout yep. also by throwing the ball and stopping the clock. But then now they take a timeout anyway with the clock stopped. Wow, a lot of, a lot of questionable things going on. I got to admit, I'm trying to give the the, thing, the benefit of the doubt for that, but I don't know why you would do that with the clock still. The clock is already stopped. It's third and 14. Wow. Well, Thursday night, you can catch the final two episodes of The Battle on ESPNU and get an inside look at the HBCU Marching Band World of Bethune-Cookman and Florida A&M. The show goes further into the training, discipline, heart, and soul of the competition that are the classics. The Battle, presented by AT&T on ESPNU. The final two episodes will start Thursday at 7 Eastern. We were watching that before we came on the air today, as a matter of fact. It's a fascinating program. So don't miss that. Some questionable things uh, strategy-wise happening here the last couple of minutes on both sides. All right, you got to figure that Florida a is going to run the ball. Bethune should, unless they score, Bethune should probably stop the clock. Do you consider a field goal here if you're Florida A&M? Yeah, uh, definitely you do. All right, just because go ahead that and make puts it you seven. seven. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what that means? You got it. <laughs> With the way Bethune yeah. has had a tough time kicking extra points, should they come down and score, they got a guy who's one for three. Right. That's yeah, great if you're a uh, Derek Jeter. One for three is a good day. Not good if you're a kicker. Sylvester. Now he'll get to the 10, so it would be a 27-yard field goal for Trevor Scott, and he does come trotting out, and now we see the official stopping the clock, and Bethune is out of timeouts. So Trevor Scott is one for one today. And he's looking at what would be a 27 yard field goal. Bethune Cookman. He's only had to make one come from behind victory this year in this 10 and 0 season of theirs. And they trailed Hampton. Charlie Neal was at that game, called it, and they trailed him 18 to 16. Hampton kind of gave that game away with five turnovers. And Bethune was able to pull out a 23-18 victory. You see what Trevor Scott has done on the year. and pretty dependable. You see that Sharon Bethune's huddle. They're talking about penetration and trying to get the block. Stranger things have happened. If oh. they can get a block here and, and a scoop. The way this game has gone at times today, I expect anything to happen here. There's a flag down. Let's see what the referee has to say about this. Wow, that's going to be a first down for roughing now the he, kicker. Personal foul, too. It was not running into the kicker. He gave the signal for personal foul. So that should be a first down. Personal foul. Roughing the kicker on the defense. Number 33. So they're going to take the points off the board. And now they can run the clock out. They, they can just take, You're take right. a couple knees now. That's right. This game's over. You're absolutely right. You see right there, just takes the bad angle and runs into the kicker. Just takes the bad angle right here, runs into the kicker. That, that's a good call. Might have been enhanced slightly. Yeah, a little acting job there. But nevertheless, it was a good call. Well... You said, J.C., they had to go for penetration, and they just didn't get it properly. And so FAMU takes some knees, and Brian Jenkins and Bethune Cookman lose their undefeated season. But as Charlie Neal has reported, in all likelihood, Bethune would be the MEAC representative 
And they're going to run the ball and, here. Uh, again, why? I, I, why would you do <laughs> and, okay. risk a, and risk a fumble on the exchange? Just take a knee. But Thune Cookman can't stop the clock. You got to be smarter in these situations. The we happen to be on the side where the FAMU fans are, and they're starting to celebrate. But they'd better wait. <laughs> they're not. That's not the victory formation. Sylvester will score. Now, in all likelihood, wow. Bethune is not going to win this game, but that was an interesting call there. Yeah. It looked like Bethune even let him go in. I mean, the object is to win the game. Be smart. Take two knees right there, and yeah. the game is over. It is over. You're it, right. I don't know. I, I, I don't understand there. Well, that'll be for Joe Taylor to explain to his media. And the, the folks who cover Bethune are going to yeah. want to know about this, I too. Mean, it worked out well for them because they scored, but... They've got a family got player limping off the field. A three-touchdown day for Philip Sylvester. Other than just wanting to, to run the score up and, and rub it in the face of, of Bethune-Cookman, you know, now you have an injury here. Shelly whereas, Anthony. Yeah, whereas if you just take a knee, the game is over. You're in the locker room, you're celebrating. Yep. Charlie Neal is handing you a trophy on the field, which is going to happen anyway. But I, I, I admit, you know, it's, I'm, I am a little puzzled, and I think we both are. It works out for him. Sylvester gets into the end zone. They get an injury on the play, but... Is it just because it's a rivalry? Are we it missing that be. aspect of I mean, it? Maybe that may be it, that they just want to run the score up on their rival and make it look worse, but a win is a win in this situation yep. because you erase, erase their undefeated season. You now tie for the conference championship. The score really doesn't matter. And right now, now you're lining up for a kickoff and everything when you could be already at midfield celebrating. Yeah, uh, it's um, it could be message sent by Joe Taylor to the other sideline. Whatever it is, only he knows the yeah, answer. But I think that's something that they've got to look at. And they really didn't manage the last couple of minutes very well anyway because they were snapping the ball too early, leaving a lot of time on the play clock. So, you know, that's something I'm sure that they'll look at and evaluate so that the next time they're in that situation, maybe they'll be a, be a little smarter about it. Now again, and they're having to clean some debris off the field and clean some of the ice from the uh, liquid shower that uh, was hit on the coaching staff. And you only hear one band right now, and that's the, the FAMU band celebrating. And that kickoff will go through the end zone. So the tune, out of timeouts, 28 seconds. We also have to worry a little bit about any kind of pushing and shoving after a play, although we saw nothing there on the kickoff. But what a night for Philip Sylvester. What do you have, two yards in the first half? Yep. Look at how he finished this game. And by the way, it is no coincidence that every one of those 100-yard rush games, FAMU won, including tonight. So they remark the ball at the 20-yard line following the touchback. So Jackie Wilson will see if he can come up with a miracle here. And he'll throw it deep down the field into coverage and almost intercepted. You wonder what would have happened if Matt Johnson had been able to finish this game. Starting quarterback, the top player in the MEAC in offense this year, the player of the year in the MEAC, the most efficient passer in the MEAC, injured. Yeah, well, now you got to think, how's that going to affect them going forward? They're, yep. they're going to probably still make it into the yes. playoffs. And now you're without your, your best player because he got injured out there yeah. today. And so where does that leave this team? What we are, Charlie Neal has reported is a fractured scapula that's under the armpit. You know, playoffs, heck, start next week.
That's a great catch. Once again, going up is Reams. He's made a couple of really acrobatic grabs. He gets out of bounds, stops the clock, 13 seconds to go. He's a senior out of Miami High School. Down to the 40-yard line of FAMU. One more time, Wilson. He's going to everything he's got. And knocked away at the two-yard line. Listen, after watching that Jacksonville game on last Sunday, any pass that goes down there like that, I'm not going to give up on. Yeah, anything is possible. <laughs> and, and again, you go back to why he, they shouldn't even have the opportunities yeah. right now. This game should be long over and the celebration already taking place. So five seconds to go in this game and five seconds remaining for Bethune-Cookman to be an undefeated team. A significant win for Joe Taylor. He's had plenty in his career. This will be win number 222. Number 10 on the FCS list is 24th win at Florida A&M. And I'm going to bet certainly one of his most satisfying final play of the game up in the air. And there you have it. The winner of the Florida Classic is Florida A&M ending the undefeated dreams of Bethune-Cookman. Even though the Wildcats will be moving on into the FCS playoffs. But FAMU adds to their distinguished record in this game with this 38-27 victory. But Bethune-Cookman still will represent the MEAC in the FCS playoffs, but this defeat may change their seeding because there had been talk they were going to get a, a bye. Well, now that we have 20 teams, four get a bye, there was some thought that Bethune-Cookman would be one of those teams, but that may not be likely now. And as J.C. mentioned, the injury to quarterback Matt Johnson does throw a shadow on Bethune's chances in the FCS postseason. And even though it's only about an hour drive south for Bethune-Cookman from Orlando to get to Daytona Beach, it's going to be a long 60 minutes on those buses. Our final score, Bethune-Cookman 38, excuse me, Florida A&M 38, Bethune-Cookman 27. Now stay tuned. Coming up next, we will have the Lexus HBCU post-game report. We welcome you to the Lexus HBCU post-game report. And there's the final score. Brian Jenkins suffers his first loss as the head coach. Joe Taylor, a warm embrace for these two coaches, two rival universities. Battled this one right down to the final minute before Florida A&M stepped in front of Bethune and took out the undefeated season of the Wildcats. However, they will represent the MEAC in the FCS playoffs. If I told you that the star of the game would have two rushing yards, yeah. JC, at halftime, Philip Sylvester, you would have thought, I know you already think I'm nuts, but you would have really thought I'm nuts. Yeah, and, and that was the key to the game, and we talked about it. Second half, they had to get him going, and they really did. He ends up with 146 yards rushing, three touchdowns, and he was really the key. They had to get him touches in the second half, and they really started going with the lead plays, broke a lot of tackles, and really wore down this Bethune-Cookman defense, and it really started to take its toll, and you can see all of the missed tackles and did a fantastic job in the second half. But then Cookman came into the game giving up 143 and a half rushing yards. They gave up to Sylvester just 146. And in fact, FAMU racks up 460 total yards in a game today, way more than they normally put, and certainly way more than Bethune has given up all season long. Three touchdowns for Philip Sylvester, six straight 100-yard rushing games, and FAMU is undefeated in all six of them. So this is what's happened to the MEAC standings, our Lexus MEAC standings. Now a three-way tie, but Bethune-Cookman will still represent the conference in the FCS playoffs, and there's, I guess, the possibility of either South Carolina State, most likely, or Florida A&M getting an at-large bid, but it's for Florida A&M a gratifying win whether they play another game or not. Yeah, no question about it. 
So our final score here from Orlando, Florida A&M 38, Bethune-Cookman 27. For my partner J.C. Pearson and Charlie Neal and our entire ESPN crew, I'm Dave Lamont. Coming up next on ESPN Classic, it's Laughlin Extreme Bulls. A reminder, Thursday in ESPNU, watch the final episodes of, of the battle starting Thursday night at 7 Eastern. This seating has been an exclusive presentation of ESPN, a worldwide leader in sports. Good night all from Orlando.